the Hagman and Hagman Report for today. It is a terrific Tuesday edition. It's Tuesday, April 28th, 2015. I'm Doug Hagman. With me in studio is my son, fellow investigator, fellow researcher, Joe Hagman. Together, we are the Hagman and Hagman Report. Our job is to bring you the news that shapes the headlines, not what you see on television or hear on the partisan talk radio networks. No, the news that is being shaped and twisted, convoluted, and hidden amid a funhouse of smoke and mirrors and a carnival that we do call the corporate media. We'll do the headline and news triage so you don't have to. Well, we'd like to thank all of our new listeners for checking in with us from all over the world. Thank you so much. We appreciate all of the emails. We, 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 don't, we don't have time to respond to all of them, but we certainly read them all. For our new listeners, we broadcast live each and every weeknight from 8 to 11 p.m. Eastern Time. Our home base on the Internet is hagmanandhagman.com. That's two N's and the word and spelled out. So hagmanandhagman.com. We're simulcast by the Christians United Broadcasting Network. If you go to hagmanandhagman.com, there you can pick up links to all of our live shows. You can pick up the links to our social networking sites and uh, uh, our archive, everything. And you can listen live via our website. Tonight we're going to be pier- piercing that particular fog of disinformation, misinformation, and misdirection, helping you see what's important but are not meant to, to see. Joe, we've got so much to go over tonight. The world is on fire tonight, isn't it, today? I mean, the world is on fire. I think it's being extinguished. Uh, (laughs) Last night it was a little bit on fire. But no, there are some serious things going on. We have and may have, again, uh, unrest in Baltimore yesterday. Uh, There's a headline on Drudge they call race riots. Um, There were a huge amount of protests that broke into violent riots yesterday in uh, Baltimore. We had a 8.1 earthquake go off. Uh, I need the name of this this location. I don't want to say Nepal. Uh, that was Nepal, uh, Nepal before. Almost uh, and Kathmandu and 4,400 uh, confirmed last time I, I heard, which yeah. is earlier today, up to 10,000 feared dead. A um, lot of, art- I mean, not that this is more important than lives lost, but uh, a lot of ancient uh, artifacts have been destroyed from the earthquake, and to yeah. me, that that's kind of a, there's kind of a message being sent there. Not that there's anything. Again, I'm not trying to diminish the life loss, but um, I think you're seeing a divine reset take place here, and some some level of judgment take place as well. Um, and people might say, "What did people of Nepal ever do to warrant judgment?" Well. To me, it's just it's just judgment. Well, it, yeah, it definitely speaks to the time that we live in. Also, we have an Iranian ship has intercepted an American ship and is holding it, quote unquote, hostage. If you will say say that Iran seizes cargo ship Pentagon sends destroyer. Hmm. Um, we have uh, e- economic news. We have news from the Pope. We have. Uh, Intergovernmental news, one piece here from Obama warns of anti-globalization sentiment in both parties to Obama, U.S., and Japan leading the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, Agreement, which you know, bypassing Congress to destroy the, right. destroy the sovereignty of the United States, which has already been destroyed. Well, we have to get into that. But like bin Laden, uh, apparently you can destroy it more than once. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, well it, and it you know you know it, it's to me uh, as we as we scan across the landscape of headlines it, it it's it's pretty somber when you look at things. And um I, I was out several times today and and you look at people and I I just don't think people are getting it. I don't think people are getting the dire uh the direness the lateness of the hour. Now some people are. But uh, to me I I think people are living in this fantasy this this um, this level of denial, where hey, you know, we're we're working, we're, we you know got things to do, life is normal, Starbucks is open, let's go get food, and you know everything is relatively okay. I mean, things are not great. They 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 know that they can feel it, but but they're denying a lot of things. One of the things that's on my mind, that's been on my mind. I, I spoke with Greg Jackson on Sunday, and uh, we I, I came had um, had I had the 
capability or ability. I shouldn't say capability. I had the capability, in it, but had I had the uh, time, uh, I was thinking about speaking, uh, doing a special s- Sunday show on this, and, and it just didn't come together. Is this the uh, homosexual yes, marriage yes. that the Supreme Court is um, set to rule on? Um, religious leaders are calling on members of the Supreme Court's liberal wing to recuse themselves from the blockbuster gay marriage case that the court will begin to consider today. And right. They heard not, uh, two and a half hours of oral arguments today. And, and this and, article uh, is talking about uh, the demanding that liberal justices sit up. Uh, they're calling for Supreme Court justices who have stood over and carried out ceremonies uh of gay marriages, Kagan and Ginsburg, yeah, two of them, to recuse themselves, right? Which they're, they're not going to, and <laughs> you, you know, and I would. Here's what I believe. Okay, That's like the president sitting out. I'm not going to yeah. decide this war. I'm not going to make this. You guys go ahead. I'll recuse myself. Well, well, it, you know, after talking with, with Greg Jackson, and, and of course, uh, not too long ago, uh, Greg had an 89-word expose on our website, and he, there's also YouTube that is um, going around. But we're going to hit this hard tomorrow because this is so important, because this is tied to, um, if you go back to 1973, Roe v. Wade, uh, the, the and, and I really, um, perhaps we should make this a, a program rule, and this is tongue in cheek, more or less. Okay, uh, but there is no such thing as gay anything, except unless unless you're talking about uh, some level of uh, happiness, happiness or joy. Okay, because words, see, to me, this is one of the big problems that that America, Americans and Westerners in, in general, are facing. The language has been redefined. Now they're attempting to redefine our culture and, and our lifestyle and the meaning of everything. So we have to be very specific when we talk about homosexuality oh, and, yeah. and lesb- lesbianism. Uh, well, homosexuality uh, and, and uh, the transgendered agenda. But, but that, see, what people are, are not understanding is this, what we're seeing today, happen today with the Supreme Court. It didn't just happen with the states banning homosexual marriage. This is not, I, I mean, it, it, it came before the court because of states banning homosexual marriage. However, the agenda began with Kinsey. Remember, the, you remember Alfred Kinsey back in the 50s, the Kinsey experiments, the, the Kinsey big sexual uh, doctor. And uh, uh, he had all of these experiments. Again, we're going to be getting into this in depth tomorrow, but but people really have to understand, I believe, Joe, that what we're seeing today is the end game of a of an agenda that was that was put into motion that ties together the communist agenda. And and people might laugh at this, and if they do, that's fine. But but do your research. I, I I've read. And Joe can attest to this right now in our studio. It looks like a uh, 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 a library puked up <laughs> books, okay? Because there are books everywhere, open to different sections. But if you, we did so many, um, so much research on this on on the homosexual agenda. This is extremely important to understand how where this came from, and and who the allies are with respect to this. But my belief is this. I believe that the Supreme Court is going to rule on, along partisan lines. <clears throat> I believe they're going to rule like, uh, along secular lines, along the the uh, wishes of the 2% of the 1.5%, along the political correct, sure. non-hateful, sure. Uh, equal action, um, whatever you want to call it. Well, like just like you're saying, they're yeah. going to rule in favor of homosexual agenda, equ- equating it to a civil right that doesn't exist. Exactly. And we we all have to remember, and Greg does a marvelous job pointing this out. And I am preparing this for exposure tomorrow. For uh, I'm going to have this all laid out tomorrow. The reason I didn't do Sunday, 
uh, in addition to some time issues, some extremely sensitive things that, that, that were happening on, on this past weekend that I really don't want to get into, but um, I had to take care of some things. But um, it was probably good because because tomorrow, when you hear the truth behind this agenda, it touches every part of your life. life. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I don't care if you know someone who's homosexual or if you don't. Uh, it doesn't matter if, if if you if you think the, if you think homosexuality and homosexual uh, marriage is the least important of all issues facing us today, and if you think it's just a mere social issue, oh, tune in tomorrow because I'm going to tell you uh, exactly why. It's that's incorrect. I'm going to tell you why this this it, this will be the Roe v. Wade squared or time to the hundredth power because come the end of June, when the Supreme Court decides in favor of homosexual unions, the gates of hell will open up on Christians and on middle class families. And if you fail to see the connection there, well, just tune in tomorrow. But but uh, I just want to let let people know that um, you know this what's going on in Washington is no small matter, and has been planned. They have been working the lobby uh, that is funded by people in Hollywood, by uh, funded by uh, scientists, by doctors, by special interest groups, by communists by politicians the 300 conservatives who have who filed the amicus brief uh in favor of homosexual the homosexual ruling 300 conservatives okay yeah we're going to name them all if you didn't see that amicus brief that was filed 300 conservatives the pastors who are saying yes we we will we should allow this because we shouldn't well it's the policy of inclusion the vatican the jesuits the the the, the real core issue behind this that includes polygamy that includes pornography that includes pedophilia that reaches in every level of our society this is a, a very critical moment in our history and if my parents were alive and, and even to, to some extent I should have been paying more attention in 1973 uh, although being young of course <laughs> I should have been paying more attention I, w- I would really like to ask my parents, where were you? What did you do? Because I know you didn't believe in abortion. Why didn't you say anything? Because, well, if we don't say anything now, if we don't do anything now, and, and I will I will recommend this, we as a people, as a Christian group of Christians, as, as a Christian remnant, Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot afford to follow, to obey this law. The law or the ruling by the Supreme Court, when it goes against biblical law, is not a law at all. Again, Greg Jackson speaks to this very well on this. Tomorrow's F broadcast will include an audio clip from that Greg Jackson had created. But when you've got a, a Supreme Court ruling that that goes into this, or, or that rules uh, against the, the law of God, it is no, it, it is not a law that we should follow or obey, and we should obey it to prison if necessary, or we are disobey it to prison if necessary. There are a lot of tentacles to this, and the ju- the judiciary ju- judiciary, I'm sorry has been infiltrated. And, and you know, out of the three branches of government, and Greg Jackson pointed this out to me as well, that judiciary is the least, um, or should be, or is classified as the least important or or potent of the three branches. It was never, the judiciary was never designed to create law, which is what they're doing. 
Not at all. And that's exactly what they're doing through activism. And, and if you follow the money and the judicial activism, you'll follow or you'll see exactly where this all leads to and what the end game objective is. And, and it does tie, you know, and people think like yesterday's program, people were saying, well, uh, out of all the, all the stuff that's going on, uh, the uh, the giants and the fallen angels, well, how does that relate to what's happening today? That is the core of what's happening today. That's the impetus for what's happening today. And if you Biblically, yeah. uh, <clears throat> Jesus mentioned two times in the past, which would be like the times in the future. He mentioned as in the days of Noah, so too shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man, and also as in the days of Lot. Yes. And in the days of Lot, that was Lot living in Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham and the angels coming to retrieve him and his family from Sodom and Gomorrah before destroying the whole thing. And we, Noah, the days of Noah, we know that angels, fallen angels, came down to earth and mated with women and made giants, and the giants became unsustainable by humans and became flesh-eating monsters that devoured mankind, and mankind thought nothing but evil continually, so they were wiped out. Those two very examples said. are yes. the examples we are given and told that would be happening again when Jesus Christ returns to for his millennial kingdom. It, it, precisely. And, and as I as I sit back and, I, and I'm looking at all these books and uh I'll, I'll tell you I'll tell you what I was up at uh, 5:30 this morning I was went to my office and opened up the books and was reading and I've got a notebook full of notes and uh of course you know monitoring what's going on in Baltimore and uh the Supreme Court and the clashes in front of the Supreme Court and of course overseas things and I'm looking at this and I just had to sit back I had to sit back and I had to think I just I just thought you know I I knew when I started paying attention to, to things like 79, really started paying attention to international politics with the hostage crisis in 79, I, I knew things that were, I knew that we were headed for a very, very uh, uh, rough time in the near future. But I never really thought that I would see what I'm seeing today. And, and I got to tell you, it's, um, I brought my dog with me to the, to, to the office and, uh, I mean, thank goodness for for puppy dogs and flowers, right? Because you can look at them and, and talk with your dog, and you know, I know, I, I guess it's just it, it, things are heavy. Things are very heavy right now. But anyway, tomorrow night we're going to be getting into that, uh, and the this goes back to the Tavistock Institute. This goes back to, I mean, there are so many tentacles to this. Uh, you've got to know the truth, and you've got to know the charlatans who are speaking out and propo- proponents of this. In saying that this is about equal rights and about uh, heterose- or homosexual marriage, it's not about that. It's not about that. This is a direct attack on the family. It's a direct attack on our Christianity. And what's going to happen, folks? The ultimate. And I'll just give you a little spoiler alert for tomorrow. We're going to tell you how this this ruling will criminalize. What will make Christians criminals? You want to know how Christians will be imprisoned and muzzled? This is how through this ruling. Of course, there will be help as well, and and it's interesting because look at the rise of of ISIS and, and Islam, right? And, and look at how Islam handles homosexuality. Joe, they're they're open and tolerant of homosexuals, aren't they? Real they have tolerant. gay pride parades all the time. Yeah, that's what I thought. The ISIS float. <laughs> yeah. Don't be surprised if you see an ISIS float in the Rose Bowl, Rose Bowl parade next year. Um, the way Obama's going. And the other part, too, Obama's role in this. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, we interviewed Larry Sinclair. I will um, I will bring that interview back up again because it's relevant to what we're talking about. Uh, Obama, I believe, and, and I've said this before, Obama was chosen to lead us into this area of, of this era. I shouldn't say area, this era. And he's doing it. And it's interesting. Judy McLeod from Canada Free Press wrote an article, and I'm straying a bit, but that's okay, titled, it was just published uh, today, or yesterday, I'm sorry, W, meaning George W. Bush, rips O, meaning Obama. What's wrong with that picture? Very succinct article from Canada Free Press from Judy McLeod. And she's 
taken George W. Bush to task over, well, basically, what took you so long? But I'm going to go a step further here. We, with all due respect to Judy McLeod, who I think is an excellent investigative author, researcher, and journalist, I just I just really think a lot of her. And uh, I'm going to just, just bump Judy a little bit and say, you know what, let's go back. And I've talked to her about this, and she agrees. Let's go back to... Uh, to both of them being on the same playing for the same team. That's all. I mean, it's it, it because George W. Bush and his father George Herbert Walker Bush, none of them said anything about his eligibility. None of them had said anything that demanded accountability for his previous past or for his past. Well, let me stray just for a second here because something just. I just want to say this. Um, you know, we're talking about a lot of heavy things, and I know we have we've got a lot of listeners who are alone and who are elderly and firmed and just feel just feel like you know, my gosh, I just can't take it anymore. And I, I I felt that way earlier today, and um, there's nothing. I mean, you know, I'm not infirmed. I'm, my son might think I'm elderly, but not really. So I took my dog for a walk, and uh, a long walk. And sometimes I, I, I think that the walks are proportionate to the heaviness that, that I feel. She's still sleeping off the walk, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> but uh, well, <laughs> the, the thing that a couple of things. Um, I, I just want to tell you. It doesn't matter if you've got a family, a great big family, and have all the support that, that you need, or if you're alone. I just want to tell you that, you know, I, I hope you know that we, both John and I feel, and I feel very close to every every listener, even if we don't know each other personally. I feel close to, to, to the people listening because, you know, we all, I mean, we're all in this, this soup together, and we all have... We all have our, our our issues, our medical problems, our scheduling problems, our the, you know the roof leaks, the, the car needs uh, repairs, the gas payments late. The, you know we all. I mean, am I hitting? Am I hitting? Yeah, you all understand what I'm talking about? Am I hitting the, the right notes, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay, and, and sometimes it just gets so overwhelming. Why do I even listen to programs like this? Because it's, I mean, man, I got enough problems. And nothing, nothing against anybody else and their shows. Um, for the most part, I mean, especially in the mainstream, except for the exception of the car ride over here, I'll turn on Fox News or MSNBC Radio just to hear the, their talking points on whatever the main headlines are. But I've I've tuned out most. Uh, Shows altogether. I'll listen to clips of, from Pastor Begley and yeah, you know Paul McGuire YouTube's and yep. uh, you know catch Alex Jones clips here and there. But um, I, I guess I used to be I used to be a radio a sports radio junkie. And when we would travel out of town, and this is back uh, out of high school in my younger days, I used to listen to Jim Rome all the time. Oh, I remember that. I, I couldn't stand that. We had battles of the radio in the car, you know, especially when we travel. And you know you'd like to listen to Rush Limbaugh or back uh, then I did yeah uh, Michael Savage and I'd want to listen to Jim Rome and and uh, any other sports show that was on and I remember one time in the car and my dad saying to me you know what is you, what do you get out of sitting here listening to somebody talking about games for three hours that have no meaning on life if you're going to listen to something listen to something worthwhile. And I'm like, all right, whatever, old man. I, I get it. You uh, like your politics, and that's fine. And I, he was actually more respectful than that. But okay. <laughs> I hated politics back then, and I never, well, I never, it never grew on me, thankfully. But no, and I, then we, I changed, and we started listening to the the current events and the the, the Rush Limbaugh's, and one of the, we started listening to Rush Limbaugh. At least I did. I remember he did this campaign to vote for Obama in the primaries against Hillary. To beat the Clinton machine. Oh, I remember that. And you know, I started listening to Glenn Beck and all the, uh, these people back then. And Alex Jones is somebody who I listen to regularly. Once I started listening to him, 
uh, that really opened up many avenues for me to research and to go out on my own and to, to lessen the voices that I let into my mind. But the more that we listened to these radio shows, uh, the more it was evident that people always wanted to talk about uh, the problems of the world and never offer any solutions aside from what their own ideological, yeah. political, um, you know, right or left paradigm uh, allowed for. No mention of Jesus, no mention of the Bible, no mention of the root of the problems being evil, uh, from the devil to our own human nature, no mention of anything, of any real important truth. And, uh, you know, we're talking a series of years where you go from listening to uh, politics, not really understanding much about how the the real world works, to um, having a better grasp on it than most people. And I'm not saying that at any pride, but just... Um, when you're an investigator, when you're paying attention, when you're trained to to find and spot anomalies and um, coincidences and uh, things that are not correct, and the more these jump out at you, you know, you have an, as an investigator, you have a, a drive. Even if it's, I mean, we could have been working a workers' compensation case, and uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, uh, we'll say a treasure hunt came up, we came across, you know. Um, as an investigator, you're going to want to look into whatever it is that is the mystery. That's and right. so, you know, as the mystery is inherent in you, or you, right? It, it, it's both a conditioning process as well as it being inherent. Go ahead. Right. Well, when you're, uh, you know, a youngster and you're uh, brainwashed into being an investigator <laughs> by forced <laughs> child labor, no, okay. yeah, that's true. But no, really, it, uh, the investigative part. <laughs> Uh, if you were an investigator, uh, I don't think my mind would work anywhere near the way it does today. Not that it works better or worse than anybody's, but it just thinks differently. That's right. And, and, and again, like you said, it not that that's either good or necessarily good or bad. It's just the way that you've been conditioned to work or conditioned to think, I should say. And but you know what? When you were and talking, the whole point of that was yeah. I've the more that I learn the more that I read and the more I pray and understand the less I want to hear people and it's not that I don't like them because I do I mean I do like I said tune into Pastor Begley when especially when he has a YouTube video where he's talking about a certain um like Jade Helm will say a certain issue uh or Paul McGuire when he talks about he does his videos um from the you, you might want to Santa clarify Barbara, Santa yeah. Monica uh, the ocean in the background and he's doing his talks he's very articulate right but I, it's hard for me to sit down, and I'll turn on shows and listen to whole shows, but that's usually when I'm doing stuff around the house. I don't intently sit and listen unless it's something that um, I yeah, want to hear but, somebody but, else's opinion on. Right, but uh, when you say you don't want to hear other people. I don't want to. I want to clarify that a little bit. It's not that I don't want to hear other people. I guess I want to understand and have my mind figure out what I believe and know. and my. I want the Lord's truth to be imparted to me before I put other people's voices in my right. head. Right. I don't and want to confuse myself. To your credit, and because I, I actually fought you on that when, when we were developing this show, and, you know, why, um, you know, why too heavy on the Scripture? Why so heavy on the Scripture? Um, in a news, analytical news show. And, and of course, well, hey, Steve Quayle, Pastor Langford, you uh, set me straight pretty quickly with respect to why, and, and of course that is why. I mean, that's the that is the why. <laughs> <laughs> well, to me, it was just uh, like you you were looking at it from a different perspective than me. I understood that the all of the issues, both good and bad, are explained in the Bible, and to get and. You know, it doesn't matter. I've read the Bible so many times, but I, I feel like I've, you know, only opened it one or two times. With the, It seems like the more you read, the less you know. Uh, the more you understand, the less you can articulate and explain. But um, if I was going to hear from anybody, if I was going to learn from anybody, I wanted it to be from the Lord. And that's the whole purpose. And I, and I think that we're so far away from anybody having being, you know, we have a small remnant left, but aside from that, people are generally secular, Christian secular, uh, atheist, or 
um, what are they, agnostic. They have no belief. Right. And we are in a time where people who are the remnant are uh, getting stronger and stronger, yet the uh, the rest of the world are vehemently opposed to Christ and are becoming offended just by his name. You know, I, I saw that as well over the last couple of days. If you want a, an education, uh, um, and, and you don't have to do this, I mean, we, we've done this, uh, but but feel free to do so. Just go on two diametrically opposed sites politically. And the only two that, I mean, the two that come to mind that are the, the heavyweights, uh, apparently, in the Internet, uh, in the sphere of the Internet, on the right would be Free Republic, on the left would be Democratic Underground, okay? These are forums where people can actually go to, and uh, people post news stories, and then others, members of the um, the two different yeah, opposing like campaigns. the Washington yeah. Examiner or, well, you know, the Raw Story, or, I mean... But, but, but they post the, posts for Fox News, right? But man, well, I, I guess what I'm saying is, t- ten years ago you would see this. Um, um, to me, ten years ago you would see this this conservative n- nature on, for example, Free Republic, even though it was a fo- uh, kind of like a faux conservative. It, it wasn't true conservatism. It was just party line Republican. But they were somewhat tolerant, or their religious part. When I say religious, the, the Christian Christianity, it was apparent, and it was not antagonistic. It was not anti-Christian. But even today, conservatives are becoming very anti-Christian, anti-religious, and anti-Christian. Now, on the on the far left, with for example, Demo- Democratic Underground, that that was that existed back then. But if you read it today. The vulgarity, the viciousness, the absolute hatred, and and see that word hatred of of anything Christian is so apparent. It, it is, I, I would say, it's obsessive among many posters. Do you ever hear the saying uh, uh, pertains to atheists? Uh, they say to atheists, you know, how does it feel to talk about God all the time? Um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. it seems the people who, you know, we have all these, with the increase of technology and the increase of um, information that is spread throughout this technology has come an influx of new theories and new um, ways of, I guess you'd say, uh, exacerbating the lie and twisting it like the old Babylonian mystery religions are now the new age. There you go. Um, yeah. They're the same, you know, the, it's like Pepsi and Coke. They've bottled up the same lie and just repackaged it under a different name. And as those continue to fan out to, you know, you have one truth, you have one Messiah, one gospel, one true word of God. But as the, and that doesn't change uh, unless, you know, you start getting into other Bible verses and um, not keeping to, you know, the Greek and Hebrew root words. But the, the point is, is that you have, what do we see now? We talk about it all the time, ancient alien astronaut theories. They're coming up with all these quote unquote new theories on uh, creation or evolution. And it's just so disturbing because so many people are clinging to all these new theories one, because I believe they've never heard and have heard or reject the story of Jesus. And two, because they know the story of Jesus is true, that he is the only uh, living God. And they are afraid and don't like that. And they don't like that because of what it means for them. Uh, and that's very selfish. But people will learn the hard way. Yeah, exactly. No, you're you're right on the money. But to this gay marriage uh Supreme Court decision. This uh, uh, don't forget tomorrow night we're going to hit that hard. But go ahead, sir. They they talk about here um, in this article about Gin, Ginsburg and uh, Kagan recusing themselves. They say uh, these justices, knowing full well the unique legal issues regarding the definition of marriage, would soon come before them. Deliberately officiated so-called homosexual wedding ceremonies, creating not merely the appearance of bias, but an actual and blatant conflict of interest. Now, my question, it, was, it would be a legal question, is 
the say we did have laws that these people had to follow. Oh, if there was as, a, wait a minute, such a, give me an example. Okay, like uh, we'll say let one of the Supreme Court judges is uh, uh, what would be a good example of this in another case situation. Uh, I'm. I'm not sure. These, well, somebody who has presided and chooses to preside over the same, obviously in favor of it, Elena Kagan is a All right. homosexual herself. Um, how does the conflict of interest get get? Uh, is there any due process to see that this conflict of interest could be rectified, that they could be recused, or is that just wishful thinking? No, no. It's at this point, it's wishful thinking. And Greg Jackson, again, and I want to thank Greg if you're listening. Thank you so much for for your the information that you've imparted to me. In his book, um, Conservative Come Back to Liberal Lies. Now, admittedly, when he wrote that book, of course, he was of a different mindset with respect to um, his political. Uh, uh, Leadings, but federal Federalist Papers, Federalist Papers, yeah. Federalist Number Seventy Eight. The right now, um, uh, well, to answer your question, do we have any? Uh, I guess your question is, do we have any redress as citizens right. against judicial activism? Not that it would change uh, the ruling of this or the history of the rulings, but we, we have to. We, Greg has spo- had spoken on this, and uh, we have to fight at the local level or at more of the local level and uh, start uh, calling for recalls and, and voting. The, and I know this sounds really trite, voting people out, because is it later than, than we think? I, absolutely, I think it is. And is it going to matter in the end? You know what? It may not matter, but if you sit on the sidelines and say it doesn't matter and do nothing, it's kind of like, to me, and I don't want to straight, well, maybe, maybe I should, if your house is on fire, and there was a garden hose or two, you know, you're going to try to put it out. You can so it might be fully involved, and it might be like, pardon the expression, peeing in the ocean, okay, in terms of making a difference, as if that's going to raise the water level of the ocean. But at least you're proactive in doing something. You know, you're you're actually trying to do something, that, uh, or doing whatever you need to do. So, it, it to me, it's our moral. And it's our Christian responsibility to do something. And by doing something, I'm saying, number one, we we do whatever we can lead within the confines of the law to get rid of these the very people that are in power that have uh, made these changes. Well, now, this, this brings up another question. <clears throat> Does the Constitution and the changes in, in the laws we live in today... Uh, does it allow, would it allow for this, I mean, is for this to be ruled uh, a success for gay marriage, for gay marriage to be legalized per se? A homosexual is, marriage. Is, homosexual marriage. Is that not constitutionally protected? No. No. Where in the There's, Constitution does it, I mean, uh, I'm playing devil's advocate here. Where in the Constitution does it say that, you know, two same-sex couples shall not be married? I guess it's my well, and this is what we're, this it, is what has been done through the confounding of right. the language and through uh, the the twisting of laws, the twisting of of, through language. of laws in particular. Okay, and this reminds me of Babel. states' rights to well, and, okay, and Babel back to the language issue. Back okay, we we can take it. Yeah, we can take it there. But but even even when you look at the, the how the Roman uh, Empire the courts were set up back then. Right. Okay. Uh, well, and, and that's uh, the law, Justin Justinian law, I believe, was is the uh, the Greek or the ancient. I have the uh, right the, the PDF here. It's so it's Roman civil law. It's, and and you know Rome was an empire or an empire. Rome was a uh, republic. It had a senate representatives that spoke for the people. It was the uh, First, not the first republic, but the first major republic that has la- that lasted as long as it did. We're the next in line, uh, which, as far as we know, what happened with the Roman Empire, and we, and we know it, what's going to happen with the Phoenix with America. The the self immolation is, is reflected by the Phoenix, and, and it, this this is why to, to go off on yet another tangent. This is why um, 
it's so important to understand the Illuminati because uh, the, the phoenix representing, that's not the eagle, but the phoenix representing America, the self-immolation, the uh, immolating um, phoenix bird, and of course the re- rebirthing of the uh, the new Atlantis and the re- writings of Plato and understanding Plato, uh, Plato's Republic and understand how that laid the foundation going forward to Antonio Gramsci, the Fabian Socialist, and going moving on. and you know, so But, but again, tomorrow, this is going to be just a terrific program that's going to have a lot of different aspects to it. it although the core is going to be homosexual, uh, w- what's going on with the homosexual agenda, uh, although that's the core, we're, we're going to be touching on virtually everything that we talked about. Because I was going to do a two, like I said, I was going to do a two-hour program on Sunday, and as I got into the the notes as well, I'm thinking, wait a minute, this needs a lot more clarification because people need to understand exactly how deep this reaches, and the other agendas involved here, which I mentioned some of them, but we're also talking about eugenics, population control, Agenda 21, Common Core. Yeah, it touches all of them. And even if you want to stretch it a little bit, the same players who are funding this, lobby-wise, are also funding the riots in Baltimore. Let's move on to those because people are wondering, hey, when are you going to talk about that? Well, of course. What's going on there is on 20 – well, exactly, almost exactly. It was April 23rd, 2012. April 23rd. What is this? April 28th, right? 2015, three years ago, I wrote on HomelandSecurityUS.com, The Coming Chaos from the Obama Satoro Playbook. And I wrote this. I said, get ready because of the riots, property destruction, chaos, and death seen in Athens and other European cities shown on television news is coming to America very soon. And, and you know, I got I got people that, that took me to task that said, you're, you're just... Uh, you're promoting fear. You're a fear monger. You you, you got no, no basis to say this. If I may, with your with your uh, permission, Joe, just let me just touch on a couple sure. of things here, uh, because <laughs> and and, and I, well, I, I, sh- I will repost this on Hagman and Hagman dot com. But I wrote back then: America and the world today is in chaos. Wars, rumors, and wars. High gasoline prices back then. Now, uh, increasing food prices still today. Growing divisions among races and between classes, current and impending financial collapses dominate the headlines. Boy, nothing has changed except for the gasoline prices. Critics and detractors of Obama claim that it's a result of his failed policies, that our house in much of the world is in such disarray. Well, okay, and then I write an investigation into the man known as Barack Hussein Obama II, the second, and the people behind him suggest otherwise. The purpose of this, or, or the um, the dot connecting that I had done back then, and this is so important today, because you're, you're going to hear people say, well, Obama's not doing anything with respect to the riots. What's Obama doing? He's issuing these little platitudes and statements. Folks, he's doing more behind the scenes than people realize. You do know, ladies and gentlemen, that Obama, the Obama regime, sent three uh, people from his administration, and I say that with contempt, to Baltimore to the funeral of that young man that was killed in, while in police custody. Now, let me just make a disclaimer here. That man who was killed in police custody should have never happened, at least in my view, based on the facts that I know only. And I only know as much as you know. But you don't, you're not fine one moment and then you're being transported the next time. You know, he, Joe, what is it? He, 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 um, he was being transported and his spine was severed. His neck was, or his spine was severed. Yeah, now there are reports um, that Apparently, he recently had some kind of spinal surgery. His name is Freddie Gray. He had a pre-existing spinal and neck injury and severe damage and scar tissue from an accident that Allstate Insurance was paying a large structured settlement to him. He had several unsuccessful spinal fusion surgeries. Most recent was an operation a week and a half before his arrest. Okay. Well, let me tell you something. I know personally exactly what um 
you know, I had a doctor tell me he hit the windshield again, and and you know, you expect paralysis or death, either one, and you'll wish for death while you might have paralysis. But having said that. Uh, we know that there's something very wrong. So, as a disclaimer, please, I, I don't. I, I there is something very, very wrong with the police, um, the militarization of the police. That's not the subject here. That we'll address. We'll address that separately. I don't agree with the militar, militarization of the police, and neither does Joe. I don't want to speak for you, but I think we're pretty clear on that, right? We're mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So, and folks, I know you. Um, most of you anyway, and I'm not going to speak for you, but I, I, obviously we are all intelligent enough as we sit around this big kitchen table of ours and, and talking about important issues. We know that we should not have a paramilitary force on the streets. Now, there are exceptions to this. There are, unfortunately, necessary exceptions to this. Um it's interesting because Radley Balco, in his book about the uh, militarization of police, writes or asks the question, is the police force constitutional? And if you think about that question, and, and if you think about the founding fathers and how uh, what positions police served back at the founding of our country, or really we didn't have any police back then. We had marshals and uh, uh, constables that served warrants and policing was was done within the community and there was very little incarceration. It's, it's a fascinating, the story about uh, the development of police, of the police forces, is just a fascinating story. But getting back to the point, um, uh, obviously there's a problem here. However, we what we're seeing is a very deliberate, an extremely deliberate uh, us versus them mentality. It's us meaning you and me, against the police. Well, a component of this is the, the war on drugs by Nixon. And we'll throw Elvis in there for good measure. Um, propaganda. The, the war on terror now, which has actually overcome, not on equal footing, but overcome the war on drugs. Although they're running neck and neck. But you see, we cannot at this point fall into the trap which we're we are being led right into a trap where we are being forced to go against the police. Now I don't agree again. I don't agree with the what what happened to Mr. Gray. I don't know what happened, but I certainly it doesn't take a, 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 a you know a Mensa right. person to, to know that something bad happened that shouldn't have happened. And it's not just him. There's several, sure, uh, especially as of late, uh, issues with police officers and uh, especially involving uh, black youth or, or, or African Americans who have been shot in the back. And you know, especially the one, I think the one was in Cleveland or South Carolina, where a man was shot in the back running from police. They planted a taser on him. There are instances from Ferguson to, um, you know, I mean, all over the country, and some of them are are very uh, messed up as far as police action, and some of them are are I don't want to say justified, but um, sometimes the officers don't have a choice. Like when the one right. officer has, you know, is being assaulted, and somebody's trying to grab for his gun. At that point, you have your life is on the line, and and decisions have to be made. Now. Um, Hey. We've gotten to a point where both sides have become so. Uh, I mean, the police are militarized, and we know that, as you said, there are plenty of great law enforcement officers out there. That's right. But there are just those few, just like there are a few rioters and the protesters who can make the whole mess burn down. Uh, it works yeah. both ways. You know, it, the old saying, you don't know, bring a knife to a gunfight, okay? Um, I, I, I understand that we have to have a certain level of force. You have to meet the force with a certain level of force. The rise, okay, the, the book, somebody asked me uh, uh, the name of the book by Radley Balco. Is, it's called Rise of the Warrior Cop. I do recommend that uh, if, for people who would like to read. Um, but anyway, when if we're looking at the situation, we have to ask ourselves, well, um, you know, what's, what's causing all of this? And uh, we've got open borders. 
there, there's on both sides. There's absolutely no attempt to close the borders. Um, you've got uh, on both sides of the political aisle. You've got this CA drug war or the CA drug operation that's taking place. Drugs are being input into or inner cities by the CIA. And people might say, "Well, that's that's not true." Oh, yes, it is. It, research bears it out. And even going back to the Church Committee uh, back in the seventies. Um, the police are at a disadvantage, but we're being led into a trap to go against the police departments, and it's easy to do, and, it, it, and at times it's appropriate to do. However, the, the, the police that, that I know, and we all, uh, I'm sure we, we, most of us know good, honest, hardworking police officers who care about freedom, care about, you know, care about uh, about each one of us. They'll stop and help you change a tire in the rain. They'll make sure that you're, you know, they'll, they're the good old-fashioned police officers, but they're being replaced by these robo-cops, if you will. But that's a different, that's another topic. But getting back to the article that I was re- referencing, if you look at the evolution of Obama from back even three years ago when I wrote this article and you start connecting the dots well you've got this shadowy cabal of government leaders and their lackeys their their complicit media moguls the eye candy mouthpieces their ideologues intent on changing the United States and the world in, in, in bringing us into this level of chaos which is exactly where we're being led to and we're seeing it playing out in Baltimore. And ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this. Today, at 5.30, and when I was walking my dog, and even now as I'm talking, I can see, you will see this flash violence move from Baltimore west. You're going to see it move from, you're going to see it just encompass the entire United States. It may not be this summer, but it's going to be soon Ethnos versus ethnos. It doesn't mean necessarily nation versus nation. It does mean, it could mean black versus white. It could mean one race versus another. I shouldn't say black versus white, but that's the most evident here. Um, Islam versus Christians. Islam versus Jews. Christians versus Jews. We're seeing a lot of that now. The confusion, the t- deliberate traps, the chaos, the deliberate, deliberate chaos. If you don't think Obama is doing anything right now except playing golf and when, you know watching ESPN, you're wrong. He is really in the background stirring this up. Not just him, but the people around him. And that's why when you know I get so frustrated. When we had the opportunity, we collectively had the opportunity to to say or to ask the question, who is he? Is he eligible, constitutionally eligible? And you had these conservatives say, don't ask that question. You're distracting from the, 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 you're distracting from the issues. B.S. No, I'm sorry. That is the issue because it's all about who Obama is. Obama is a product of the Tavistock Institute, his parents, the Tavistock Institute, the, his parents, the CIA. What do we have today? What happened to Kennedy? Well, I say that only in reference to the CIA. All of this, the connections between Bush and the CIA, what we're seeing today is the culmination, the the. We're seeing the fruits of of the roots of the labor or or of the uh, evil, as Steve would say. What we're seeing right now is is the manifestation of these plans that have been very long in play. And no one, or very few, I shouldn't say no one, but very few people said, hey, wait a minute, stop. Look at the bigger picture. Look what's going on. Whether it's Roe v. Wade or the war on drugs or whatever. How about this new issue? The moral dimensions of climate change and sustainable development <coughs> right. put out by the Pope. Uh, but you see, <laughs> here we go. Okay. And, and people, and, and like you chuckled, okay, people will chuckle at that. I chuckle it's because, unimportant. I chuckle because it shows, I mean, I don't chuckle because it's funny. Um, when you hear the Pope teaming up with the UN 
Sustainable Development Agenda 21, it just further shows the uh, hierarchy at the top level of control and the implementation. And not only do they call on the leaders, but they call on the whole, what they say, uh, all the 1.2 billion Catholic warriors to get out there and fight against the climate change skeptics. See, and and I look, I can talk about about this. I mean, I feel like I have the moral authority to talk about this, having gone to a minor seminary. Uh, I, I believe, and as I a Catholic, baptized Catholic, confirmed yes. Catholic, went to Catholic school. And and when I, when I when I told my father, I I I said I I cannot, in good conscience. Uh, still be a Catholic, knowing what I know. My father didn't talk to me for a year. I've got a, I've got a cousin who's a Roman Catholic priest. Not not happy with me at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, it can't be like that. We can't have uh, disagreements that lead to discommunications, or uh, we. I mean, especially us as believers need to get to a point where we are unable to be offended by another person's words um, or beliefs. Right. But see, the, what the Roman Catholic Church, and this is one thing that was pounded in my head in, in the seminary. It, it had nothing to do with the Bible when I was in the semin- seminary. The Bible was used as a historical book to talk about church history, not about... Uh, not, and the focus on when I was in the seminary was not about Scripture. It was not about the Bible. It was church history. History and church hierarchy. And I don't know if this, uh, any people who still attend Catholic masses out there, if I've heard from two separate people now who've told me that they do no longer have any Bibles in the Catholic pews. They have a pamphlet for what teachings they're going to go over for that week, and that's it. No more Bibles in the Catholic churches. So if you feel like uh, I think that's I think that's regional, Joe. I I, I heard that too, and I, I spoke with a, a an old classmate of mine. Ah, this was probably two three weeks ago. Um, our reunion's coming up, which I won't even tell you how many years. But he said this. He said because uh, uh, I, I was talking to him about, about Bibles and about the uh, studies and with with the parishioners and and uh, they're moving away from using the actual because I was the, the original question I asked him what what version of the bible do you use for your parishioners and he said well we have this amalgamation of works that we pre- we present in our parish that he's a, he's a head of his parish so anyway that's getting off track but uh, I know we're up against a break I can't believe how quickly this hour has gone folks I hope you don't think that we've I've wasted your time tonight, but but tune in tomorrow about uh, because tomorrow is going to be such an important show. It's going to touch on everything that we talked about with the core focus, primary focus, the Supreme Court. Yeah, we're going to start there. Yeah, and and but but touch on everything else, and uh, we're going to bring Stan Dale on. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, with that, we'll take our break now. Ladies and gentlemen, to hour number two of this Tuesday edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report. Today is April 28th, 2015, and as every Tuesday comes, so does Mr. Stan Dale. His website is standeo.com. We call him the real Indiana Jones. He is uh, a great friend of the show and a, and a blessing. And, Dad, I do have a note here from Stan. You need to set the DVR for channel 376 as Stan's interview is on now. Okay, hang on a second. Wait a minute. Three three seven six. Channel three seven six. Okay. And uh, let me go to the studio monitor here. Hang yeah, on. We Hold got on. it right down here. And uh, sorry, right. Stan, I forgot to tell my dad, so we missed the first okay. few minutes here. But here's the studio monitor. It is now. Let's uh, see if we can see his. Uh, there it is. Prophecy Watchers. Okay, stand by. And uh, there he oh, is. Oh my goodness, Stan, we're seeing you live on TV. Okay, now okay, I got to hit this oh, button. Oh, gee, that sounds good. I'll have to turn mine on and, and put it on record as well. Okay. I wish I looked that. Okay. There we go. There we go. Okay, actually, this, this has a feature. It goes. Are you recording the, it now? Yeah, it goes back awesome. to the beginning uh, where it records. Wow. Uh, and folks, that's uh, anybody who has Direct TV. That's channel three seventy six. You can watch Stan Dale live right now, or prefer if you record it, listen to Stan live now, and watch it later. That's right. Wow. Uh, welcome back to the show, Stan. Uh, how was your week? Oh, busy week uh, already. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, science side of things has been what I've been more interested in this week, I guess, than 
you know, watching what's happening over in Baltimore, that's depressing. I guess you guys have been covering that this morning or this afternoon. Yeah, we touched on it a little bit. We did not, I mean, we touched on the uh, the root cause, you know, the, the death of uh, Mr. Gray and the mishandling by police, uh, not just here in Baltimore, but in so many other cases around the country as of late. But there seems to be something completely different to this Baltimore uh, violence because the excuse that is used on TV is that a group or groups of high schoolers wanted to start a protest outside of a mall. And somehow this protest turned into violent riots. And um, at least for me in my research, there's a a gap. There's something missing uh, as to why this escalated the way it did. And there's a lot of uh, with the politicians locally and, and statewide, uh, a lot of things, uh, sound bites that were said. You know, the the mayor, uh, for one, saying we're giving these people time to to uh, destroy or their space to destroy, and then trying to walk that back and say she didn't say it or her words were twisted. What do you make of all this? Do you think this is spontaneous? No, no, I think it was orchestrated. Um, you know, it, uh, they've been busing in people, I'm sure. And when the, the usual talking heads get up there, uh, you know, from the left-wing side of things and start, you know, telling us how bad it is and how bad, the you know, the police force is and all that kind of stuff, you can see that they're just trying to stir up trouble. And, you know, you don't hear this kind of stuff if you have a white-on-white white attack of any kind or, you know... Um, it's treated fairly, you know. You get the truth about it. But a black uh, fellow, uh, you know, white on black attack, you don't get a true picture. It, 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 you can just guarantee they're going to not tell you the truth, and they're going to fabricate things to make it look worse than it is. And it's not it, in the main. It's not the community that it's happening in. It's people that are, you know, um, activists that are, are bust in or drive in or whatever to participate in it and stir up the locals and tell them, you know. You'll be on TV or whatever. You'll you'll help the cause, but yeah, I mean, and 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 that police uh, chief there, that mayor, sorry, that mayor, when she said that they couldn't re- return the force, apparently that came from the uh, the White House, and that's just crazy. I mean, <laughs> you know, if they mm-hmm. had rubber bullets, they could have bruised a few of those guys and stopped it right then. But no, had to let it keep on going and destroy those businesses. I. I don't understand that, except it's part of a, an effort to um, bring about civil disobedience so that martial law can be inflicted on us. I, I totally agree, Stan. In the, hi, by the way. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Good evening. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's a sad thing, uh, really. We were I was, during the first hours. I was saying how how heavy that my heart you know, my heart is tonight and has been all day and. Um, well, over the last, I don't know, days, uh, but especially with Baltimore, this is really, in my view, an extension of the orchestrated chaos that Obama and his people around him were put in the position uh, um, to, to really usher in. And, and I think that this is what we're seeing is just merely the in game, this is kind of like the the, the last uh, quarter of, of the game, um, or, or even if if you want to take it in a, in a different uh, analogy, th- this is the riding after the the game where you see all the, the the fans, if you will, you know, overturning cars and you know igniting cars and looting and stuff. But but we're in the end in in part of this, I believe. This is to me this is. Uh, Really, just the the flashbang of the uh, of the fuse that was lit a long time ago. Yeah, there's so many things that could be happening this year, and, and I think are going to happen to uh, give us a lot of grief here in the United States. That this is only one of the thread curves that we're going to see. Um, certainly, it's one that we can visualize very easily after watching the news events, but. Um, You've also got to consider things that might happen in the Middle East, um, forcing Russia to, uh, and perhaps China, to uh, attack the United States eventually, an EMP weapon, something like that. Uh, I'm holding my breath. I mean, you know, we're seeing a lot of people 
that normally wouldn't come to our website, you know, or seeking us out on uh, Google because they want to figure out how to get ready when they lose power and, uh, you know, the economy collapses and stuff like that. So by the the number of increases that we're seeing, I know that people out there are starting to worry uh, for good reason. <laughs> what a what a yeah, dark year. Exactly. Y- yeah, um, and I think last, toward the tail end of last year or even m- maybe uh, – mid-year last year, I I think you had indicated through conversations, multiple conversations, that this this year, as did others, that this year was going to be a a, a tough year, a a very pivotal year in terms of events, and I think we're seeing that play out. But, uh, you know, we don't want to drag you down here, Stan. You you had mentioned uh, if you want to go go elsewhere, we certainly can. Um, It's up to you. Well, um yeah, hold on one second. This is a lot of, uh, okay, sorry, I'm just okay, checking on, a, on another news story here. Okay, now, uh, yeah, the um, uh, good news type things, well, you know, I've, I've got some things that I found interesting uh, that are uh, science things and CERN things. Um, and the first one that I want to talk about is the servers the um, uh, the computers that are analyzing the data that CERN is getting from the various tests they're doing, because they're not only running one test to see if there are parallel dimensions or find the the, the God particle. That kind of, that's only one of a, of a lot of um, experiments that they're planning to run on the CERN system. And um, I was looking today at their computing power to analyze all the data they get. Um, and, you know, when you figure that uh, 600 million times a second particles collide inside the the, uh, you know, the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, when you start analyzing the impact zone of that, that, that goes into lots of numbers, uh, lots of zeros after a one, as to the amount of data that you've got to reconstruct in your computers. And their computer can't do it all by itself. Um, they formed what's called the LHC Computing Grid, which is um, um, a community of other computers all around the planet. And um, they link 8,000 physicists around the planet into their server farm. Now, they've got the main room of it, which is, um, oh, I don't know what it is in square feet, but in meters, it's uh, nearly 1,500 square meters. And you can see a picture of it there on our show images page Mm. Um, but when they distribute this kind of computing power um, they're allowing uh, more and more computers to come in in parallel to that and uh, hook up and they can expand it and they're talking you know um, 45 petabytes of data storage on disks and I'm wondering I mean this is like They've got 100,000 computer cores working at the moment. They're going to expand it with another 20,000. Yeah, Holly said it's over 16,000 square feet. She just uh, did the the conversion for me. Wow. Uh, You know, and there are 11,000 servers uh, in there with those 100,000 processor cores. Now, um, what I see there uh, with this concept of of the distributed uh, processing they're using is that we're looking at a computer system already in place that could handle much of the load for a world economic system, a digital money system. And I just wonder, since all the countries in the world that have joined are are major players in the world economy, if this is something that they know about and they're going to be able to tie into for emergency digital money, uh, you know, a program they could throw onto the Hadron uh, Collider's computer system. Anyway, just a thought came to mind. That much computing power just boggles the mind. And you can read about it and the details of it there by clicking on the um, you know, the text beneath there, and it'll take you to their website. Now, out of all the experiments they're doing, the, the one that you want to look at is the Atlas experiment. And I've got a link to that uh, homepage and to... Um, descriptors of the the experiment uh, and a virtual tour you can take. These are all in the top row there. So you can see what they're looking for 
and how they're doing it and uh, what subsystems uh, are used to uh, get the information. So if you use what I had there last week as far as you know tracking their data and stuff like that, you'll understand more about it when you click on the things that are tied to the Atlas experiment. Anyway, that's kind of good. So, uh, okay, so, so just so I'm kind of on the same page here, uh, multi-purpose, multi-use, um, the thing, I, I guess you're telling us to think a little bit bigger, think outside the box as to what uh, what the capabilities and uh, potential use is are uses yeah. are yeah okay mm. yeah I, I just think um, you know it uh, a computer is a computer all you got to do is put software in it your programs to do what uh, you want it's the processing power and uh, I've been wondering you know is there another one, you know, the beast computer, you know, that they've been talking about for years over Brussels, or is it this, or is this tied into that, and you, it, it's part of the distributed processing? I don't know, but when you see this kind of computing power, you know, you, you have to kind of get somewhat excited about it. It's big. It, it, can that, and, and forgive my ignorance on this, but could this be easily um, hacked? I, I mean, I, I guess with something this huge, this, um, you know, that might even sound like a ridiculous question, but but um, could could this be brought down? I mean, you know, it, I mean, obviously. Well, you know, parts of it might be, uh, but I think that... Um, whatever computer or computer network they're going to be using for the world economy has to be just about in place already now so that it can be switched on quick enough to avoid anarchy across the planet when the world economy uh, coll- you know, just collapses. But um, like with any system, if you've got access to it over uh, phone lines or Internet lines, um, it is possible that someone could hack in. However... I suspect the way they've de- they've designed this is that they can isolate the uh, segments of it so that only a portion of it would be um, hacked. And the advantage to hacking would, um, I, I suppose, be to bring it down or something like that. But since I know for decades they've already been backing up, you know, financial transactions with credit card companies and stuff that are already linked into the system, they've been backing up at the close of every business day. So the most data that they would lose is someone hacked in and brought it down. It would be probably a full 24-hour uh, trade cycle, and they just bring it back up from the reserves, um, even local reserves on site in each of these segments. So I don't think that we'd be able to, you know, bring it down if, if anybody wanted to, because you know it's just going to be so integrated to everything and so backed up that it, it's the only thing I yeah. think that would take it down is an EMP pulse, something like that. Well, you, you make a good point, though. Um, it has w- whatever this digital currency or this digital tracking, the mark of the beast, whatever you want to call it, uh, or all of the above. It, it's got to be operational now. Um, and, and I think people, I mean, that's a great point because when everything does uh, take a tumble, uh, tumble and dive, well, uh, yeah, something has got to be right there, ready to go. To, um, yeah, they won't be able to, to wait weeks and months and stuff like that because the, the the society has to have a method of exchanging goods and services, and um, so I, I know that it's there uh, somewhere and uh, probably, as I say, distributed so that uh, you might hit one node of it, but then they'll be back up and functioning, you know, uh, on another node or backup uh, systems around the planet. And, and the trick. The, it could be functional at a at a higher level, and and the way I just see this coming into play would be, um, you know, you you got this working on the nation state level, the computerization, the, the financial computerization, and then of course it would trickle down into um, each, well, from nation state into the uh, populace, and of course, yeah, I mean, if if you want to be, if you want your money back that you had in. In your bank account, you you got to sign on. You, you have to become part of this digital currency, and part of becoming part of this is going to include um, this uh, mark of the beast uh, scenario. Um, I, I guess it really doesn't. Uh, it, it's pretty clear to me. 
Yeah, or some variation of it, but I mean that that's kind of the, the, the nuts and bolts of it, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. Yes, it's uh yeah. interesting times. Interesting times. Yeah, and, and and try to do business outside of the system, you automatically you'll become a criminal or uh you, you just won't get services or, or goods or services or uh, uh you won't be able to play. You won't be able to live. Well, if you, if you, yeah, and if you're tracking, or sorry, if you're hacking to um, um, steal money, let's say from somebody else or some company, and put it into your account, that's not going to be any value to a hacker because the system will have a record of where the debits and credits went to to that hacker's right. number. Uh, it won't be like you can cash it out in the gold or silver and run around and trade with it because gold and silver will probably be uh, marked as illegal trading to the you know the average person. Only nation states will be able to trade in those kind of things. So you'll be a, a criminal if you try to trade in old dollar bills or old euros or uh, you know gold coins or silver bars. That, that you'll be uh, accused of being some part of a of illegal operation of some sort. What well, you know what Stan? What I found amazing is even today, if you were trying to get a mortgage today, for example, and um, Let's say, um, let's say you had five thousand or ten thousand tucked in your mattress. You had it there for years, you know, and you say, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to go put this money down on the house uh, to buy a house or you know my first house. You can't do that. You cannot do that. They will not accept that. Now they'll accept it if it's been in an account in in account for uh, a period of time. But they want the paper trail. You can't. It, it, and I never knew this, but and and people have said no, that's not true. But try it. You, you can't use. Uh, I, I mean, uh, it's now you can buy a house. Uh, we'll say for cash, all cash. But you, you've got to. Um, but if you want to use cash, you had stuffed in your mattress to put down on the house. They won't take that because they they don't know where it came from. So you're automatically. I mean, that, that's criminalization of cash. Yeah, look, I I mean, I know that you could still deposit cash at the moment. But yes. When the crunch hits, um, they may let you deposit for a certain amount of time and say, okay, you can you know, bring out all your mattress money. But even that, you'll probably uh, get a reduced amount of dollar value or new credit value than what you thought. Because they will have the ability to tell you, well, okay, that five thousand old U.S. dollars is only worth, you know, five hundred um, new new dollars for for the world or you know, digital dollars. Now that that may not be a big deal because they may adjust the pricing of a lot of goods and services down by ten times as well. But um, I know the United States at the moment, with the weakening U.S. dollar, we're going to get hard, get hard for things after it, it happens as far as all the goods and services that we buy that are imported. Um, you know, we don't have the backing to whatever the new currency is to get excited about. It's gone overseas to a number of other places in the form of gold, silver, and oil, and you know, energy. Um, <laughs> anyway, yeah. Wow. That's, it's, 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 it's not going to be as easy as people thought. You're well, going to need it, the goods. Yeah. You, you, and even that, you see, you don't want to brag about because they're going to make it illegal for you to hoard stuff you know you, in times of you know quote unquote crisis um so people who are you know uh, preppers are going to be labeled as enemies of the state because they're hoarding and so their goods are then going to be fair game it's going to be a time when you don't want to be on the planet you know um uh, yeah, I'm, perfectly. I'm hoping the rapture comes way before that. Wow. Well, you know, Stan, I had a question. Uh, somebody had sent me an email over the weekend, and um, uh, it said, ran the subject line, please ask Stan uh, this Tuesday or this week. Um, well, this individual wanted to know, wants to know, the extent of, since you brought this up, the extent of um, the powers, the government, uh, and, and I can't. I, I don't recall where this individual is from. I, I need, know it's the United States, but I don't know which state. But is, is there technology? I mean, I know there's technology out there, but is there technology in use by the police departments, by DHS, by federal agencies that can 
the pinpoint. Let's say you've got a pantry, a hidden pantry in your house. Uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't know, or a hidden stockpile of ammunition, or even a hidden stockpile of money. I don't. I, I mean, whatever. Is there technology in use right now that can see through into your house, or uh, maybe from the air down into your house that can identify a certain commodity of whatever it might be? Mm -hmm. Hard question to answer. I I do know that um, uh, the sensors uh, that they put in some of the, like, stealth helicopters and stuff can fly over your home and certainly count the number of living bodies in there um, from the infrared data. Um, As far as metallic objects... uh, Things that can that are magnetic or you know can be uh, sensitive to magnetic fields, they can certainly fly over and uh, pick those. And I I know that there are high altitude or relatively high altitude um, uh, devices that uh, mining companies use to map out uh, gold deposits and things beneath the surface. So uh, using something like that in a military or government operation, I don't think is is hard to imagine. I just don't know how much. Um, infrastructure and equipment and money that takes, whether it's worth the effort. But, um, you uh, know, I guess living in the cities, <laughs> we're just going to be, we're just going to be targets. I mean, that's it. Yeah, precisely. I, I, we probably have more to worry about from our neighbors and our family members saying, hey, you know, they're, they're hoarding uh, food or they're hoarding uh, bullets or whatever, you know. Um, well, there's an incentive. I mean, they, they've, they've done this in, in – uh, Nazi Germany, even you can say, "Look, um, your, your your neighbor's got a hoard. Okay, turn them in, and if uh, if we find they do have a hoard, well, we'll give you ten percent as a as a reward." You know, so yeah, you get all that food, and medicine, or whatever they're going to give you as a reward. It's a big incentive. <clears throat> exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. You're right. Switching gears here, uh, looking at your show images page on your website, and folks, you can go to standeo.com, and on the right-hand side next to the microphone, click the Show Images button. You have an interesting graphic and and story up here, Unmasking the Secrets of Mercury. And in this article, it talks about um, the Mercury Atmosphere and Surface Composition Spectrometer instrument uh, aboard NASA's Messenger spacecraft was designed to study the surface uh, and atmosphere of the planet Mercury. Um, what uh, I, I see the pictures here. That, are these the real colors, real photographs that you would see if we were sitting out in front of Mercury? Uh, no, they're, they're um, interpretations of the different frequencies that they're using to analyze the surface of Mercury. Like you were, we were talking about, can they find gold you know, or silver or bullets or whatever flying over your house? Well, this, in essence, is what they're doing with with equipment going around Mercury. And what you're seeing here is a part of several frequencies that they analyze the surface of Mercury with. And each frequency is assigned a primary color so that you can see that the uh, blue area has more of a certain type of uh, emission uh, than, you know, the yellow or the green or the red areas. It's quite a a pretty picture, the the rainbow uh, effect it generates. But it's a way to to map uh, the, the surface for a number of uh, properties. Uh, reflectivities and stuff like that are fairly simple, but um, this one goes into more detail as far as uh, minerals uh, and um, depths of things. Um, you know, it's you can read the article. It, it, it's quite a, a beautiful concept, and it produces a beautiful image. But it does answer a question that we were uh, addressing a while ago about what can be seen through the roof. Um, hmm. I'm sure this kind of technology can be extrapolated to a, a helicopter. Interesting. Okay. Wow. Boy, we sit here. We sit here in, in our house, and uh, we're you know just across the highway from uh, the south end of uh, Fort Carson, and uh, you know. Last night, I think we had it happen about three times, but it happens frequently. You'll hear one of these kind of feathered uh, stealth helicopters come right over your house. You'll woo-woo-woo-woo-woo like that. And so now now then, 
thinking, well, okay, they got the infrared on or whatever. I'll lean back in my chair in the living room and wave at the ceiling because I didn't want them to be disappointed and see nothing happening, you know, when they're spying on us. <laughs> uh, mm. That's bad. Well, you, you certainly anyway. have... That, yeah, uh, take us wherever else you want to go. You certainly have, and, and folks, go to standale.com. That's standale, D-E-Y-O.com, uh, to the right of the microphone. Click on the show images page, or you can go to our, if you're on our site, uh, we have got a direct link to the show images page for tonight. But uh, take us take us wherever you want to go. What, 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 what excites you today? I mean, well, what do you find? Well, you know, as I said, I, I'm on a, kind of a, um, technical rant today. The um, that link I send you to there for uh, our show images page, where you, you go to the uh, Mercury pictures. If you go to the read story part of it, you'll see a lot of other interesting stories that you can read later um, that NASA puts up uh, about various projects they're doing. Um, to the right of that uh, show images link, um, I have the story of the. Uh, uh, X-37B, which is a miniature version of the shuttle. It's unpiloted, but it's remote control. That has just come back down to ground, and they've uh, been refurbishing it and are not telling anybody what it's really doing up there. It's secret. Uh, Lord only knows what they're testing up there, but they're going to send it back up in a few weeks with a new kind of uh, ionized xenon gas thruster which they want to put into satellites, which means that they can run the satellites for a lot longer on less energy. It's just part of a number of things that they're letting us know about. But this uh, thruster they're using is use what's called a Hall effect. And, you know, again, if you click on the, the, the story part, it'll tell you, you know, how many um, kilowatts uh, that uh, thruster will use and, you know, how many... Uh, pounds of thrust. It's not big, but it's enough to keep what they call station keeping for the satellite to trim its orbit uh, for deviations in gravitational field and solar storms and that kind of stuff to to keep it at a distance where they want it and on an orbit that they want. But you can read about it by clicking onto that, and it will give you a bit of a rundown, and there are links within that article uh, to kind of more general descriptions uh, about this um, X-37B craft and what it can do as far as what they want to tell us about. It's, um, okay. it's an interesting thing. But anyway, we know for, for sure that they do put things up in orbits that they don't tell you about. And if you ever do look at one of these NASA maps of the little red dots around the Earth that show tracked satellites, whether yeah. they're American or Russian, that is so busy. I mean, thousands, right? Like at least five thousand yeah. are there. I do that when I use think? my telescope outside to to uh, when I see something moving um, in the sky. I I bring up my computer. I have Stellarium. Then I have the satellite tracker to make sure I'm not seeing a satellite or trying to rule out exactly what it is that's in the sky that I'm looking at. Yeah, and yeah. he's got one of those. Joe's got one of those. Uh, remember, uh, Stan. Remember on Art Bell they used so to eight, advertise the eight inch. Uh, Deep Space Hunter. The, um, yeah, I'm trying to remember the brand name of that though. Oh, Celestron uh, um, or um, oh, Celestron. No, it, it was um, Deep Space Hunter. Um, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember the name either. It, yeah, Art Bell used to used to talk about that in, in, in a huge telescope. I mean, the size of a small refrigerator. People think know. it's a hot water tank. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just it's it's, it's uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. So I uh, uh, <laughs> and the moon is like uh, my goodness, you could uh, you can almost uh, see the you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. particles. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. Crazy. I uh, th- th- what uh, started all this was uh, I was looking at those all those red dots that, that uh, Joe and I were talking about as far as positions of satellites are, that are orbiting around the planet, and you know. We haven't heard about 5,000 launches of satellites or more. I mean, I don't know how many dots are really there. That's you know, what they're showing. But when you think about it, that means that you know, at least 5,000 rocket launches of satellites have been done by somebody to put them up there. And from our viewpoint, looking at those that cloud of red dots orbiting the planet at various altitudes, 
it's like uh, a minefield, you know. I mean, it's it's cluttered. There's a lot of junk up there. It's you know they're, they're definitely doing things that that are not being made public. Are, are there? It's my understanding, Stan, that there are these. Uh, some satellites can deliver. Then please correct me or enhance what I'm asking. Um, there are space-based lasers that are pretty doggone accurate that can be used to take out an aircraft, we'll say, or to to, um, to paint and ultimately take out an object on the ground. Is that science fiction or is that true? Well, um, yes and no. The, yeah, they can uh, put a, an orbital laser up there that might be more like a maser, microwave uh, laser, because they have to choose frequencies of light uh, that are you know, like magnetic radiation that do not bend uh, or distort in the Earth's magnetic field. One of the problems they had on the ground trying to use laser uh, weapons on board ships and things is that if you're trying to track something, say, five or six miles out, that ambient conditions in the atmosphere and in the magnetic field will cause that beam to wander off target. So you had to have a way to um, deliver it to the target and not let it, um, you know, be deviated by the magnetic field. Same problem in orbit. In fact, a bigger version of it. You can't overcome that with uh, directed microwave beams. You you can overcome it with um, a laser beam that, um, say, you know, is strong enough to ionize the atmosphere straight to the target and then pulse. Um, you know, toroidal rings of uh, charged particles along that wire to the target. Uh, the big problem is that it does snake around a bit, and uh, so you, you've got to get there, do the job very quickly before ambient conditions, you know, take it off target. So, yes, I mean, I'm sure that uh, they've, they've got stuff up there like that that they want to uh, to use or may use in a time of war, uh, like okay. the, the James Bond movies. Well, and that brings me to another question here that I promised uh, somebody I'd ask you. Um, it, it, this goes. This speaks to the Baltimore riots. It also uh, goes to, or yeah, the Baltimore uprising riots. But it also goes to previous uh, uh, discussions we've had uh, on this show. There appear to be in use acoustic or sound weapons against protesters, against people, rioters. Um, it, how, um, I guess the first thing that uh, that I, I'm supposed to ask you is, to what to what degree are these in use? Do, do, do you know, um, for example, you know, the, the big, oh, you, I'm sure you've seen them on the trucks, the, the big, uh, they look like a, a bass drum, and uh, they supposedly emit some sort of sound that that creates uh, um, nausea, for example, or disorients the yeah. people. Uh, you can uh, actually you know? create sound. You can create the sound in the nervous system of the people you're you're aimed at. You're aiming it at. I've seen this demonstrated uh, uh, on television oh, years ago, where they would take a flat panel, um, and that panel would be this modulated um, sound, but it was sound that would only appear in a human brain when it was pointed at the brain. You wouldn't hear it otherwise. It wouldn't uh, reflect off of surfaces, and, and, you know, you'd hear it like normal sound. And they had a guy stand on the stage. He was the the guinea pig and uh, probably the host of the show, as I recall. But anyway, they took this uh, flat panel with having music playing through it, and um, the guy you couldn't hear anything. You couldn't hear anything in the studio. But as soon as they swept it past, you know, pointed at his head, uh, it gave him a blast of sound he couldn't believe. Which led me to think about, you know, the, the nefarious uses of such a thing, where you could say, take some very suggestible individual and say to him, you know, this is the voice of God. Here's what you're supposed to do. And you create a Charlie Manson out of him, you know, just by talking his brain because he doesn't realize the voices can be produced by this type of technology. Extending that, then, as far as a sound-based weapon to control crowds, you can make it so painful that it paralyzes the people for a short period of time when they get hit with a beam like that. Huh. All right. It doesn't break down the neighbors or anything else. It's a directed... uh, 
neural sound wave. It's, it, it can you know, overheat it, you a bit, but that's about it. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah I can imagine. And, and that goes to, uh, I mean, we, we could take that in so many directions. The deception, the upcoming deception, uh, the alien deception. I mean, uh, and it, we can go look back in history, the, the shooter, the naval yard shooter, hearing voices, you know, was uh, such a weapon perhaps used against that person um, to direct his, his rampage? Uh, you know, what, I, I mean, there's so much to, I, I don't know. I, it's just I'm a modern, ver- it's a modern version of the uh, Manchurian candidate type uh, mm. you know, technology. How do you fight that? Is there any? I mean, I'm serious. You put tin foil on your head. I mean, are we are we really <laughs> to, to, to that point or what? <laughs> well, I I um, I suppose you could shield it that way. Um, you probably want to be in a, a total metal box, um, you know, or like yeah. a, a metal suit, like a a knight suit or something. But. Um, you know, if I understand it correctly, if it hits your nervous system anywhere, it'll transmit along there. Um, but, you know, like any weapon, there's probably a way around it that uh, is even simpler than that. Um, maybe a way to reflect it back, you know, reflective mirror uh, for that frequency range that uh, you just use a mirrored shield. And like Captain America, you point it in the direction of the incoming and uh, you're shielded. Well, well, it, it almost seems like we're not, you know, in the in the final thrust of the war, the earthly war in which we're going to be engaged. There are going to be weapons that are so powerful, so um, oh, you know, overpowering that I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, we're going to be able to fight off what they've got or what they will use against us. I mean, it's just it's that's why we don't want to be here, right? <laughs> I, I, I hear you. Okay. Uh, back uh, back to some technical uh, spacecraft news. There is reports that a launch to the International Space Station is now out of orbit or missed its mark. Russian spacecraft spinning out of control in orbit with salvage bid underway. The Russian space agency Rosco- Roscosmos is scrambling to yeah. regain control of robotic progress 59 cargo ship that appears to have suffered a serious malfunction shortly after launching into orbit early today. This is uh, the spacecraft that is bringing supplies to the International Space Station. In this article, they go on to say that there was a malfunction with the data. They weren't able to um, get it properly lined up, and it has now the potential to spin out of control, and they will possibly lose control of this. If this were to lose control, to your knowledge, is there any uh, danger of this falling back to Earth, or is this something that will spin out into space? Well, I think its orbit will degrade. It'll come down to the surface eventually. Um, they might be able to um, to destruct it, but they would want to do that way down in the atmosphere because if you blow up something like that while it's in, in high orbit or you know, even though it's quasi-orbit, you put out a bunch of uh, flak or, you know, shrapnel that can interfere with a lot of other satellites over a period of time. They try to be very careful about what they leave up there in orbit uh, for that very reason, because it's just a a minefield. If you hit those things, say say your satellite, whatever it is, is going around the Earth in um, a, a clockwise direction, it'll be doing it at around 17,000 miles an hour, give or take a bit. And if it were to run into one of these pieces of debris going in the opposite direction, in a contrary orbit, it might hit it at a relative speed of 34,000 miles an hour, and it'll destroy the satellite and the the junk that it hit. So it's varying degrees of impact if the the, uh, craft that they're losing control of or have lost control of were to be blasted apart, then its pieces would probably be going in a clockwise orbit. Most of them seem to do that uh, for whatever reasons they're using it for. And that would mean that it would be at a much slower relative speed should it impact other satellites in the the heavens up there in orbit around us, Um, you know, down in the order of hundreds or maybe a few thousand miles per hour different speed. So 
it might be something that a satellite could um, endure and still function were it hit by a piece of that debris. So best of all, if they could get it to descend, if they could get it to rapidly head down to the atmosphere, especially over, say, you know, uh, an ocean area, then it would burn up and the, and the pieces that survived would um, go into the ocean and not be a great drama unless there's something we don't know about that would pollute the the ocean. And it's, they also have... It's a problem. They have a backup system called the Telerobotically Operated Rendezvous Unit, which allows the cosmonauts on the station to take manual remote control in the event of a system failure. So... It's not a lost cause yet, uh, from what the report says. No, it, uh, I don't think it is yet, and certainly they, they're going to be doing their best on the, uh, the space station to uh, get it in because it's a supply module, you know, food and coffee and, you know, good stuff. Yeah. Um, we, we have a, I, I, can I break in here? I, sure. This is a rather interesting question, Stan, and I'm not even sure we've ever addressed this with you. Um, this is a listener from New Zealand wanting to know why and why did the United States um, stop the space shuttle system or space shuttle program? I'm not even sure we we ever, you and I ever talked about this or we ever spoke about this, did we? Um, well, no, I don't guess we did, and I I'm not sure I know um, the answer to that. Um, one of the things was that I heard of, you know, which was public knowledge, was that the technology was getting so old that it wasn't reliable to keep on, you know, keeping the shuttle program functioning uh, with all the old technology. They certainly haven't gone about making new technology, though, have they, that we know about to replace the shuttle program. So, um, you know, all of that story may be true. It uh, it kind of bespeaks uh, that they're trying to um, use an alternate method of doing whatever they're doing rather than telling us about it. Okay. Yeah, I, I just I, – when I saw that question pop up, I thought, you know, I'm not even sure. It, it just kind of just, bam, you know, we just stopped doing it and – uh, okay, well, that's interesting. Uh, we, a question from a listener. Uh, Doreen wants to know if you have any information about possible volcano uh, eruptions, steam plumes uh, being observed in Nevada, uh, and if this is something that we see an uptick of volcanic activity here in the United States. Um, what she she's seen uh, the 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 steam plumes coming up in Nevada is that what she's saying? She provided a link to a man named Dutch Sense, and it's oh, yeah, titled Dutch. Vol- yeah. "Volcanoes in Nevada Erupt Steam Plumes." Weather Service observing the event, and yeah. I'll send you this link in this well, tape. It talks about uh, cold from Cold Springs to Middlegate, Nevada. Steam plumes from a volcanic field near Cold Springs, Nevada, where plumes of large large enough uh, to be seen from the sky could uh, are, are being seen. And I'll throw this here in your Skype now. Um, and we've been getting a lot of questions about volcanic activity from Yellowstone to uh, I even and, and this is kind of separate the. Island Catalina, they're talking about it. it's possible sinking uh, and the cause of a tsunami that would happen after uh, that event, if that did happen. Um, kind of like what you're talking about, the you know expanding and the contracting of Earth. It seems like the Earth is continually moving, and as these things happen, uh, from the earthquake we saw uh, just yesterday to things like this with Nevada uh, and Yellowstone, the Old Faithful, not blowing as much with the geysers as it used to. There seems to be some kind of geological uh, changes inside the Earth and, and on the outside of the Earth. Yeah, I think so. The Certainly the volcanic activity is increasing. Uh, we, Holly and I have looked at that, and it's definitely on an uptick. No question about it. And Dutch Sands, uh, his, his analysis of these things is really quite good. Um, uh, I, I visit his stuff quite frequently. The, the there are a number of uh, volcanoes that are uh, technically dormant, you know, not extinct, that have been active in the last oh, 
24 months, I suppose now, that are quite serious. Um, this earthquake over in Nepal is another serious sign of things happening. I mean, when you move a, a mountain range like that 10 feet closer to China all of a sudden and uh, you know, kill 4,000, 5,000 people, this is no small event. So both earthquakes and volcanoes, which do tend to uh, increase, you know, uh, at the same time, uh, are on the increase. Um, uh, so I, I wouldn't be a good time, I don't think, to move to Yellowstone just because of that. I'm certainly living on the coastal areas of the United States or the West Coast and the New Madrid area, probably not clever because of these increasing stresses on the surface. The Bible does tell you that in the last days of this age, we're going to see increased earthquakes in various places, diverse places. But um, we're seeing that, and we're seeing an increase of it where people live, which is an important thing because earthquakes out at sea or that don't produce big tsunamis or whatever, and earthquakes in remote areas that don't really damage world economy or populations – aren't too important. So it's talking about ones where people dwell and thing, ones where it will affect the world economy. Those uh, earthquakes in diverse places, like all over the place, increasing, are a sign of the, the, the end of this age. Mm, man. <laughs> okay. Uh, I just happened to uh, just check your show pages, uh, show page, uh, show images page. I'm sorry. Blood. Yeah. Falls in Antarctica. Um, oh, I yeah, didn't see was, this. That that was astounding. Uh, it, it's a river of looks like blood that's frozen in, coming out of the ice in the Antarctic, and um, what it, it is living material, but it's bacteria apparently that's uh, multiplied to, in the brine seas back up into the ice pack. There, you can see the little rivers of it which look like kind of brownish lines running down the, the ice pack. And they they say that the brine sea that was entrapped there in that ice was twice as salty as normal seawater and that these bacteria flourished in that. And if you think about it, the, the red tide effect that we've seen in the lakes um, in northeast Africa, you know, turns the water to blood-looking because of various algal blooms. Well, these, they don't say these are algae. They say these are bacteria, which are living matter producing this this blood color. But it, um, you know, it uh, it's nasty looking, isn't it? That's the best I can say about it. it uh, and <laughs> yeah. you can read about it by going to the link there. It gives you more uh, of a detailed explanation of it. But yeah, it's called the Blood Falls. Uh, it... Uh, there's even a tent there where one of the researchers uh, are camped right next to it to see what it's all about. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that, but it is on the, the show images page today. Uh, definitely, I mean, it caught my eye when I saw that. And uh, I, the, the first thing I thought of was some sort of a mass whale slaughter. But then, uh, now that you mentioned the, uh, well, bacteria, the... Uh, Algal blooms. The, there you go, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Moses I, I, turned the water. I had, I had put his stick in there. He had to, Aaron do it to, to turn the, the waters in Egypt to to blood. Well, this may have been a function of temperature and uh, the algal blooms that hit all the water there in Egypt, because we we, we do see uh, whole like lakes of blood color st- uh, substance that stinks because it's living material when it dies. That, uh, you know, I mean, however God had Moses do it, it does seem that God uses uh, natural phenomena on the planet as part of his judgment in large quantities, of course. But we might be looking at a similar type event that was happening down there to the Antarctic because of the salinity and because of the the conditions at the time when this, when these bacteria were multiplying. Okay. And understood. Um, I have a uh, listener actually from Singapore. Interesting. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, hello, Singapore, by the way. Uh, wanting mm-hmm. your take on the recent earthquake uh, in the context of CERN 
um, any relationship, potential relationship. We're talking about the earthquake that happened this past uh, weekend that they're still, you know, counting the dead from in Nepal. Um, anything there or anything abnormal on your radar with respect to the most recent earthquake? Realizing, of course, you know, you touched on that earlier, but uh, 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 anything on your radar with respect to the the location? No, no, I, I don't know. It's not saying it, it didn't have an effect, but it's hard to know without being able to look at the numbers really involved in the magnetic field coils for the CERN device you know, when they're using it and uh, the subsequent events after that. I really think we're seeing... Uh, an increase in the earthquakes and volcanoes due to uh, geophysical factors rather than to you know, mankind and the CERN. It, it, people just don't realize how much energy it takes to trigger some of these events that we're talking about. Um, it, it's a lot of a lot of energy in the magnetic field around the coils at CERN. Uh, I grant you that, and it could put a little bit of a wobble in the magnetic field uh, uh, you know, near the surface. But remember that the strength of a magnetic field decreases on the square of the distance. So that, that uh, you know, at one mile away from it, uh, it'll be one value. At uh, two miles, it'll be one fourth that value, and so forth. You know, on the square, and uh, so it, it rapidly diminishes its effect. So the magnetic field of the Earth is deep down in, and we're only seeing the top part of it here, you know, up on the surface. So, okay, you know. I, I can't rule it out completely, but I just say that it's probably not not what caused the earthquake there. All right. Oh, I just uh, it's interesting. We have so many people with so many different questions. This one it seems well references an oldie, but remains a goodie, shall we say? Um, please ask Stan. Uh, with all the talk of potential domestic terrorism here in the United States. Um, well, this this uh, listener wants to know your take on well your inf- your expertise about. Uh, r- r- you'll recall suitcase nukes in inside the United States, uh, especially during the Cold War being brought over, prepositioned. Um, are they still? Would they still be? Uh, well, let's just say that there were suitcase nuclear devices or small nuclear devices. It was smuggled into the United States during the Cold War, and and I, I don't know really much about this, Stan. So you're going to have to kind of walk me through this. Would they still be viable? I mean, do they lose power? Do they lose efficiency? Do they have to be maintained? Uh, is it, are they still something to worry about in terms of a nuclear device, a terrorist nuclear device? Well. Whether the one that we're talking about during the Cold War or he was still functional or not is not really the main concern I have because I know that that you know the Russians, Chinese, uh, the Israelis, um, us, we have tactical nuclear uh, devices, uh, weapons that uh, a, a man could carry on his back. And with our borders being so porous, uh, the placement could be done real time right now and just walk on a cross to the city you're going to be at and uh, blow the the bomb. I'd worry more mm-hmm. about those and the illegal immigration that can carry that stuff in than I would about the old, you know, rusty ones that the Russians had. Um, there are a few of them around, apparently, but um, there are many more, much worse, uh, that are real-time and new that we need to worry about. Okay. Well, hopefully that, yeah, I, I, well, uh, answers that question, and that, that's an interesting question because we hear all of these stories, all of these accounts, you know, about these su- nu- uh, suitcase nuclear devices or tactical nuclear devices. But I think you you redirected the concern appropriately. Doesn't well, I'd be after. more concerned about I'd be more concerned about one single EMP burst at about two hundred or maybe hundred to two hundred miles altitude over the center of the United States. Wiping out most of the uh, the public electronics, you know, the phones, uh, the computers, the power distribution, uh, you know, with that gone, who needs to bomb the cities? We'll take care of ourselves in, in, in the rioting that takes place after that. That's true. I, I get an email from uh, – I belong to a, a number of uh, 
organizations that send out emails with respect to uh, intelligence. And I get an email about, uh, I guess, General Alexander, uh, NSA veteran chief fears crippling cyber attack on Western energy infrastructure. Uh, this came to me. And of course, this appeared in the Telegraph, and there was a note with this uh, saying it's interesting the U.S. media is incapable of covering this type of information. And the, the, sub, the subtitle or the subtext of this article is, the West lacks a shield against formidable foes and is losing the battle against uh, terrorism as a chaos spreads across the Middle East. And, yeah, EMP-type blast here in the United States could take us out. Um, and with all the movement of critical equipment back into the uh, uh, secure mountain, uh, Cheyenne Mountain, I mean, is this what we're facing right now? Is this the greatest threat? Well, there might be another threat with um, a meteor strike. We know that that's in the, the uh, prophecies there in the Book of Revelation. Um, there have been a couple of reports of, uh, you, you know, from that guy down in, in Puerto Rico saying that um, there's a large meteor going to hit this year in near Puerto Rico and that it will damage or destroy a lot of South American countries. And of course, we'll get the... the uh, uh, the flag from it here, the fallout from it here in the United States as well. Um, I forget the fellow's name, but uh, I did watch his video, and he seemed to be quite earnest. And other Christian folk here in the United States have been talking about tsunamis along the east coast of, of America, and that could possibly be a result of that, that meteor impact. We do know, if you believe prophecy, it will happen at least once, maybe twice, during the tribulation period. Um, you know, that bothers me. The sun itself bothers me because it's it's just um, I want to say percolating, but with, with force, it's it's throwing off uh, uh, flares. Uh, it's throwing off uh, mass ejections, coronal mass ejections, so regularly that it's it's kind of commonplace to go up there and look at the last two days on Soho and just see flames shooting out in all directions from it. It's just very busy. And even though it may not have a lot of sunspot numbers, which is how we normally rate sunspot cycles, it has a lot of activity that is quite worrying to me anyway, that we're going to see some, well, very exotic changes in, in the surface of the sun. And we're going to feel it here in the form of heat and other effects um, you know, in the ultraviolet as well. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a, an issue. We still don't know what's happening with Israel and Iran. And with the United States being kind of hamstrung by the White House, you know, our military being hamstrung, even though we've got um, military vessels, AOC vessels, over in the area there of the Straits of Hormuz and over in the Gulf of Aden, I doubt that we'll be able to use them like we should uh, in, in those events. I mean, the, the Iranians... Uh, fired across the bow of a ship that was coming in through the straits here today. And so what did the American fleet do? They just sat there. They couldn't do anything because they're hamstrung. Yeah. That's, uh, that Iranian ship should be at the bottom. I mean, you know, I I don't know. If, you know. It's an unfolding situation that seems delicate, especially with the ongoing negotiations with the administration in Iran in the government there and what they're doing with their weapons uh, treaties and such, but um, incredible yeah. it, it, times like these, Stan. Jeez, I don't know. I know. I know. Anything, um, anything you want to cover, Stan, that we haven't talked about? Because I see we we made it a little bit past the hour. My goodness. Yeah, I think we've yeah, done it again. We're over an hour. Um, no, I think we're good. Um, I suppose we might tell your listeners that uh, I will be. Uh, uh, vacationing as Tom Horn takes the show next week or my slot next week. Isn't that the, the way I understand it? Yeah, uh, that's that, that came up. Uh, he wanted to talk about, uh, um, oh, I, my program sheet. I don't have my program sheet here. Anyway, that was the day. So, yeah, it's uh, that was the day that he had because of his travels. So, uh, yeah, enjoy enjoy your time. Enjoy your week, uh, week off. Uh, uh, and well, it just gives me two weeks to... To, to develop a lot of stuff to scare you with. <laughs> <laughs> love it. I love it. Oh, and i got to tell you, yeah. this, Stan, 
one of these times, um, you got a couple of listeners who said that you've got to have Stan just talk, even if it's for the entire hour, just talk about, uh, you know, blowing up, uh, you know, garages with the homemade chemistry set or the home chemistry <laughs> set and stuff. Uh, oh, so much. Yeah. So, so fun. Yeah. I suppose we can do that kind of nonsense, too. It's uh, certainly not focusing on the, the dire situation around us. It takes your mind off of it. It's I do remember my my dad and my grandfather. Uh, they you know went through the Great Depression, and um, their dad would tell me you know from time to time about how he and his dad, you know Grandpa Deo, was supposed to be working you know uh, to earn whatever money they could get to feed the family during the Depression, and sometimes you know Grandpa Deo would sneak out to a movie during the day just to take his mind off of it, you know, go to a movie theater. And the reason my dad knew that uh, was because dad skipped school one day and went to see a movie himself and he found his dad there. And so they made a mutual pact not to tell grandma or there would be trouble to pay. And uh, so they they proceeded from that point forward to keep that secret. <laughs> but it tells you that in the direst of times, we need to have laughter. We need to have things that entertain us uh, in a light way to take our minds off of what's around us. And we certainly need to have that incorporated in what we talk about. We do. It it provides us balance. Uh it keeps us it keeps us leveled a little bit. And I think that uh yeah, even even in the, in the direst of times, smell the smell the uh the flowers, pet the puppies. You know, and and just uh yeah, yeah. I I get it. How is your new puppy doing? I saw the nice picture you sent us of her trying to steal cookies. <laughs> yeah, surprised her uh, standing on the other side of the counter when she uh, uh, she and she knew, she knew she did wrong. She uh, put her front her paws up on the counter to to sniff uh, where uh, some delectables were, and of course uh, took a snap the photograph. I was waiting for her to do that, snap the photograph, and she's doing well. Thank you. And and your four legged uh, little ones. Our four-legged little ones have been busy here. Um, they they drafted a note to your little lady. Um, Jay's Bo was quite excited to see the picture and um, had a few things to say. And they've actually sent this this letter and a little parcel to uh, to your place today. And, uh, oh my you goodness! You should see it. Oh yeah, you should see it by the end of the weekend. Wow, we're going to have a, uh, a pen pal situation going here, uh, uh, perhaps uh, something more. My goodness, I, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, well, oh, you got you to gotta laugh, got to have fun. <laughs> Indeed. Well, God bless you and God bless Holly. You, you both are national treasures, let me tell you, and we we certainly appreciate your time, and, and our listeners appreciate your time. They look forward to Tuesdays, and they look forward to having you on, and Anytime, Stan. It, it, especially if, if there is, uh, you know what? If, if we get hit with an EMP, pr- promise me this: if we get hit with an EMP and all the electricity goes out, that uh, you'll talk to us, even though it'll, it, we're going to be talking in the dark. You'll be talking to us uh, uh, on our show. Uh, just promise me that. Uh, never mind. Well, that, it didn't the best quite. I can. Uh, <laughs> it didn't I quite. Remember the, of the, it's the shortwave club here. We remember that and. So I know how to get a hold of guys in the neighborhood that's got the big rigs. Maybe we'll still have some sort of, um, you know, shortwave radio shows. Who knows? Yeah, that's, uh, what we're, that's what we're pushing for. I mean, we're we're trying to harden up ourselves here, and, and that's uh, you know that's something that we really need to to think about, uh, Stan. I believe that we really need to prepare for, and that's the eventuality of either some sort of censorship via the internet or on the internet against the internet or and or uh some other calamity that'll that'll take us off the air so we need to it all find. it all depends on on who will be able to listen to i mean what will they have working equipment you see without an m p damaged circuit or something like that uh, mm, yeah yeah it's wow yeah, I don't think you know if that happens. I don't think we'll be worrying about doing a weekly show. Let's face it. I think we'll be worrying about surviving. And yeah. um, on that note, I'm I'm going to make a note to get extra aluminum foil for my tin foil hat. 
<laughs> make, make sure it's that. Reach it's that <laughs> make sure it's that real heavy stuff, buddy. You know, but anyway. oh yeah, that, that, yeah, that uh, very thick aluminum foil. That's right. All right, guys. Thanks, buddy. I'll talk you to take you in a couple care. weeks. God, All bless right, you, God bless you. Have a man. great, great week. That All was right, Stan Dale. Take care. That was Stan Dale from standale.com. He is an author, a speaker, and you can now watch him on TV. Again, he was on Channel 376 on Prophecy Watchers. Oh, 376? Gary, I thought... Gary Stearman. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. wait. No, we can't, I got we, it written down here. You right? sure? Yep, I, I'm not sure. Yes, you're right. Okay, 376. Okay. Uh, what station is that? That is uh, Chris, C- CTN. I don't know. What, is that CTN, 376. Or oh, wait uh, a minute. That was... Yeah, but he was on, and then after that, it looked like Tom Horn and Chris Putnam were on, on an interview after that. So uh, definitely check that out if you get a chance. Um, Stan Dale was being interviewed uh, on one of this, the several interviews he did. And for, for the – got a couple of questions here about what picture you're talking about. Uh, if you want to see the picture of my uh, – uh, of our studio dog uh, stealing or trying to steal a cookie and getting caught at it. It's on my personal Facebook page. I didn't put it on the show for uh, Facebook page, but it's on my personal Facebook page. Uh, to answer your question, uh, Cindy. And yeah, you guys, check so, that out. It's a anyway. great picture. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back after these short messages. To hour number three, the final hour of the Hagman and Hagman Report. On this, the 28th day of April 2015, I want to remind all the guys out there, well, everybody out there, folks, uh, don't forget... Pro Flowers. They're offering our radio listeners, listeners of the Hagman and Hagman Report, 100 blooms with a free glass vase for just nineteen ninety nine. They're offering that. This offer expires Friday. I got to tell you, what a fantastic special! That's Pro Flowers, folks. Be proactive. Get that special person in your life, whether it's your mother, your wife, your sister, or whoever it might be. Pro Flowers, right now. Here's the only way to get 100 blooms with a free glass vase for just 19.99. You could either call 800 Pro Flowers and use the coupon code Hagman H A G M A N N, or go to our website and click on the Pro Flowers icon, and then click on the blue microphone box, or go to proflowers.com and click on the microphone box there. Type in Hagman, and there you will receive your uh, this very this special. And folks, with all the heavy stuff going on today. And and I know you get down and, and you know man, I'll tell you what, you don't need a reason, you don't need an anniversary, you don't need Mother's Day, you don't need a birthday. All you need is just the desire to see the smile on the face of someone you love. That's Pro Flowers. Really appreciate them being a sponsor of our show. Proflowers dot com, and use the coupon code Hagman special for a hundred blooms right now through. Friday. Fantastic company, fantastic deal. Anyway, uh, a lot of news, a lot of things going on. And, you know, Stan touched on that, that Iranian situation, the geopolitical aspects of that, the Iranian situation where the uh, uh, vessel over there, 34 reportedly, I, I think. Uh, Iran sees a ship under yeah. U.S. protection, an Iran patrol vessel fired upon and boarded a U.S. protected cargo ship as it sailed through the Strait of Hormuz, the Pentagon confirmed Tuesday. The Mazer, uh, Mazerk Tigris, a Marshall Merck. Islands flagged yeah. vessel, was going through the strait when it was contacted about six by about six Iranian patrol vessels and was ordered to further enter Iranian waters. It is not clear if the Tigris had inadvertently entered Iranian waters and then was approached. When the shipmaster of the Tigris refused, the patrol vessel sent warning shots across its bow, the Pentagon spokesman Colonel Steve Warren stated. And it goes from there. Um, can, can, can we say that this is uh, Baltimore on the high seas, perhaps? <laughs> uh, I don't know. This seems a little bit more civilized. Well, you know, the uh, just so people know, the, the Farragut responded, as you pointed out, the, the USS Farragut responded to, discre- to, to the distress call. Uh, and, uh, you know, at least five Iranian ships have supposedly interve- intercepted the vessel. Now, there's some questions I've got. Uh, there's reports of where there's no U.S. citizens on board. And don't forget, 
as we look at international shipping, uh, there are things called uh, flags of convenience. Okay, so you might have a... Uh, uh, there are very few American flag cargo ships at sea. Most ships at sea fly what they call flags of convenience. For example, Panamanian or Liberian flags. So keep that in mind. Um, uh, I, there was a report that said this particular cargo ship was flagged by the Marshall Islands. Now, uh, obviously, this is an act of war. And, uh, um, uh, you know, this is not a, this is not a good situation, uh, you know, for all the the the. Um, uh, and I, I'm not sure what to make of this, okay, uh, except to say, and, and I'm not trying to, to, you know, just waste the time here in talking about this. I'm really having a uh, uh, an issue with this, obviously. Well, let me uh, give you some background as to the uh, maritime rules in this area from what I'm reading here. The Pentagon says that all vessels going through this portion of the Strait of Hormuz do so under the practice of innocent passage with right. Iran. And this is an agreement that allows international commercial shipping traffic to move goods through those waters safely as long as it is not prejudicial to good order, peace, security of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Okay, but but let's. Uh, I mean, we're accepting the official story here, the official account, as being true. And it's unfortunate today we have to ask ourselves: number one, did this happen? And, and did, first of all, did it happen? And did it happen the way they said it happened? Or is this a pretext for perhaps conflict or war with Iran? And in all reality, nothing could have happened except the story is manufactured and exactly put in our front uh, in front of our faces. Right, and I'm not in no way am I suggesting that this was um, this is all a, a you know hallucination. I'm, I'm not suggesting that at all. Um, there have been so many conflicting reports as of. For example, as of 11.54 this morning, a U.S. official had uh, told Reuters News Service that there was no indication any U.S. ship is being directed or intercepted by Iranian forces. Now, there's so much misinformation out there. Um, but, but where did, you know, out of the, okay, where did that come from and why? Um uh, others have said the ship was carrying the Marshall Island flag. And, of course, we have a defense agreement with the Marshall Islands. Okay. Um, and, and then it came out where this ship originated, uh, uh, or the last port of call was Jeddah. And uh, this, in fact, might have something to do with the Saudi influence or the Saudi uh, proxy war that's taking place with Iran. Uh, there's nothing, you know, that that's uh, to me that should be out of uh, off the table when we're discussing this. Could, could we be witnessing a new Gulf of Tonkin incident in in some twisted way? Um, Possibly, you know. And, and well, some people might say, "Well, this actually happened. The Tonkin incident didn't." Well, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually historical fact. It did happen. Well, yeah. not the way that history books portray it either. Right, right. And um, I mean, I think that's been released through declassified government documents. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, no doubt about it. But, but, but see, and, and here we are. We're struggling. I mean, can, can you tell that we're struggling? And this is not a struggling because we, you know we are uh, incompetent. I'd like to think that we're not. You know, we're very competent. We're struggling because we have to. To to, to me, um, We've got to take a look at all of the different angles of this because if we look at just one and accept one, well, eh, you know, it might be the the wrong one. But we can say for certain, if this is a ship a flag for the Marshall Islands, it's effectively the U.S. flagship due to the Compact of Free Association, in which defense matters of the Marshall Islands are, in fact, administered by the United States. So 
the U.S. will absolutely positively have a responsibility for recovering the ship and the crew from the Iranians if, in fact, this is as it appears to be or is being presented. So, uh, there you have it. Uh, man, I, you know... Well, let's just let's just say that that in, 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 and see now what would happen if we had uh, 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 this will this has a potential to affect the U.S. dollar in in so far as uh, you've got uh, well how how can you how can you assure how can the U.S. assure safe passage of of, of maritime traffic um, in particular energy I'm not saying this is this case right. here. But uh, once that happens, once we can no longer assure safe pa- passage of oil and energy, then what happens to the U.S. dollar, the, the, the petrodollar? It's gone, basically. So Correct. could this very well be? I mean, this has the potential to impact the economy in that fashion. But how many people are thinking of it in that way? They're just looking at this as a geopolitical conflict. And then you've got the Saudi factor um, that uh, if the last protocol was Jeddah, well, what's going on there? Okay, so uh, what was the ship carrying? Are there any, you know, for sure, U.S. Uh, uh, passengers, crew members, whatever? Okay, this is pretty deep. So we really have to, I mean, we're keeping our eyes on this. Uh, that's for for sure. One more piece of news, and then we'll take calls. Obama warns of anti-globalization sentiment in both parties. Um, President Barack Obama said the rising anti-globalization sentiment in factions of both parties, political parties, risks a withdrawal by the U.S. from global economic competition and systematic growth. Obama, speaking Monday in an interview with Wall Street Journal, cited opposition to free trade deals by some Democrats and attempts by Republicans to cut the Export-Import Bank as evidence. There has been a confluence of anti-global engagement from both elements of the right and elements of the left, and I think they are a big mistake, Obama said. Obama spoke on the eve of Japanese Prime Minister Abe's visit to the White House, where the leaders of the two countries plan to talk about the remaining differences of their Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement negotiations. Now, we started the show talking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreements, and we're going to talk about this more in depth tomorrow. But... um, one thing I find interesting here is, you know, Obama's talking, you know, Obama warns of anti-globalization sentiment. Um, technically, you know, <laughs> since the sovereignty has been taken away, I guess we are just a big globalized society. But if you want to, uh, from for him being a constitutional lawyer, uh, you know, they're pushing obviously towards a one world globalized system, one world economy, one world religious system, one world uh, political system. Right, exactly. But there is no, uh, you know, building up of this nation because this nation has served its purpose and is now moving towards the international uh, movements. This is why we see uh, Bush. One Bush, two Clinton, Obama, and those are just the presidents that I remember. Talk about you know a move towards internationalization, towards globalization. And, and this brings us to the uh, the Trans Pacific Partnership, the uh, mm-hmm. the free trade agreement that originally, folks, began with Brunei, Chile, New Zealand, and Singapore back in '05. It's called the NAFTA of the Pacific or NAFTA on steroids. It would regulate. Things for, that range from food safety, fracking, financial markets, medical prices, copyright rules, and internet freedom. The treaty is only said to have 29 chapters. That was from 2013 yeah, to this November. Has been, this has been around since a long time. But and go ahead. It goes on to say that um, one thing that uh, struck me from here is the bypassing of Congress to do this. Uh, Obama is looking to do this outside of of Congress, and the sovereignty of America would be given away, and what would happen is that the laws uh, under this TPP agreement would essentially surrender American laws and give the authority to international tribunals. They also say that the treaty negotiations are being conducted in secret. So, um, this in the other article uh, you printed out for me, 
talks now, these, about these this are, as well. These that, are dated articles. Okay, these are a couple of years old now. Yeah, one's they, from 2012 in November, one's right. from November 2013. But they both do state that under this agreement, America would be giving up uh, their laws to the authority of international bodies, where American business owners would be impacted adversely. Uh, anything from access to the internet to import exports, and this would not only uh, be a job killer like NAFTA, um, it would annex uh, the way that we do things. It would change and strip America of its sovereignty and rules, and the treaty allegedly would impose strict Internet copyright rules that would ban any laws pertaining to buying American goods. I mean, what are we thinking we're getting into here? <laughs> well, r- right, and and we're seeing more and more. And the the reason that uh, I printed those out back from 12 and 13 is because this is coming to the forefront again, and we're seeing this, this uh, what I would term, Obama's push for this globalization. And, you know, built into this, and I mentioned during the first hour how the Supreme Court, this push for homosexual legitimacy, legitimacy of homosexual unions and marriage. Okay, now part and parcel to that, there is an international component. Obviously, this initiative to legalize this kind of a behavior began in Europe, or well, I, I shouldn't say the initiative did, but uh, well, it did as well as the legalization process, and now it's coming to the United States. But when you look at things like the globalist trade built into that, into the human rights part of it, includes the special rights for homosexual marriage. And it's really a twisted thing. And, and there are a lot of people, and even when I look at it, I'm thinking, well, how does this relate we we've got Christians being beheaded overseas. We've got, I mean, the the the, the war is such a asym. We're fighting an asymmetrical war uh, as Christians and as really as lovers or not lovers, but um, uh, proponents of our constitutional republic and, and uh, people who desire freedom for everyone. Okay, but, but we're, we're we're well. When I say fighting, we're defending in in this asymmetrical war. Yet you've got Obama that is exporting not only our trade, but things like uh, homosexuality as well as abortion. So this is all tied together. I probably didn't do a very well exp- uh, very well in explaining that, but all of this is all. Tied together, and you know, the deeper you go, the money that's behind this, whether it's the uh, the uh, TPP or whatever it might be, the the North American Union, even which is coming back, and the internet censorship, which is coming back, the SOPA, PIPA, ACTA, in different forms, being reformulated and, and being pushed through by a very in intent Obama renegade and chief person and regime folks we're in trouble right now and I'm not sure if we can stop this freight train um, multiple freight trains that we that, that are coming at us and it's just it's really crazy so I and, and this I just want to mention this too Lou Dobbs if you think about his career when he got in trouble or when he uh, was was put on the hot seat is when he started pushing, asking questions about the free trade and the North American Union. So go back and think about that. And uh, notice how most of the people today, the, the people behind the microphone, are refusing to touch these issues. Why? Well, two words, a Lou Dobbs. One name, Lou Dobbs. Okay, Not that he uh, suffered immensely for it, uh, uh, I mean, he rebounded, but but nonetheless, he certainly paid a price for it, and so did Ross Perot, in his own way. And uh, mm. all right, let's go to the phones. We're going to go to area code seven one seven first. Seven one seven, you're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. Good evening, Joe and Doug. How you doing? Hey, very well. What's up? 
um, off subject, but um, I need to thank both of you gentlemen for the quality of your show over the past several months, especially guests like Pastor Wankford and others of uh, that genre. Uh, they've been very comforting. Um, I lost my wife last week to cancer. Oh, my. I, I know we had talked about it once before. Uh, and I know that Pastor Langford and, uh, you know, I, I've been sending out tons of emails, and I just wanted to, it's Langford and Steve Quayle, because I've been emailing Steve and others. If they're listening, thank you very much for your prayers. We got a lot of blessings during the last couple of weeks of her life. Um, you know, I think I had mentioned to you about Nancy Missler's articles on Dark Knight and surrendering to our Lord, total surrender to his will. It, it really does make your life easier when you do that. The comfort and the love that you get from the Lord is just unbelievable. Um, we uh, had been praying and walk, trying to walk closer with God for months. You know, we were at the Bible Prophecy Conference and that was a pretty remarkable event. I saw a lot of good things there. But, um, you know... We met your, we I, met you and your wife, right? I mean, Joe and I met you and your wife. Did we not? Well, I, not Joe, but you did. Um, maybe Joe was standing there at the end, but, um, yeah, at, at the table. Um, right. And, um, you know, uh, we were Man. very private about it. Um, didn't contact our friends. My wife had really good health up until about the last two months when this cancer really got evil and took over. Um, and we had been praying hard. I'd, you know, I'd pray on the way to work, pray on the way back from work. I'd pray in the shower. I'd get on my knees in the morning before I'd go to work at night after coming home and giving her a back rub and reading Bible verses or some of Nancy's stuff to her. Um, and we were praying for healing, but we were also, you know, looking at it from this, the point of surrender where you're not worried about yourself anymore. You know, we've moved beyond the self-centeredness of what we wanted, which was the healing, and we were just praying to God for help and whatever his will would be his will. Well, he took her. Um, and that's a whole other story, and it's probably a blessing that he did for her sake. Um, she suffered a lot after being in Iraq, in Iraq in, in 03. But, um, you know, we prayed for help, and we never reached out to anybody. And about three weeks before, and I was struggling. I was working full time, uh, trying to take care of the house, four pets, uh, get the garden ready for the spring, all, all that, and trying to take care of her at the same time. And um, out of the blue, people just started showing up at the house, people we hadn't contacted. I remember one morning I get this text message that says, leaving Indianapolis, uh, we'll be there in nine hours. And I go, well, who the heck is this? Is all I have is a phone number. And I'm going, okay. And I showed it to my wife, and it was her tent mate from Baghdad. Um, oh, somehow, wow. I guess they, the, all these, Arabac and the Air Force nurses and her old group commander figured since they hadn't been hearing for us, something's wrong and they're coming to Pennsylvania to find out what's going on. And I had Air Force nurses in my house uh, along with um, my wife's sister for the last three weeks helping me take care of her because I was struggling hard. And we had never asked for it. God said that God, it was the most beautiful thing that you can imagine that people were praying for us. And even though it wasn't what we were kind of asking for, God knew what was best for us, and he sent them. It was the most incredible testament to our Lord that I haven't ever experienced in my life. Wow. Uh, and, and, you know... People think I'm crazy. I've talked to a few people who don't walk the same walk that we do. And I called her a Disney girl. You know, she went through the horrors of war. You know, she felt a lot about injustice in the world. I uh, was horrified by the way people acted, what was going on in the world. 
and also what she experienced in trying to bring all these young men back alive and every mission praying to God that she would get it done, and she did. Um, you know, she had been in Somalia in January right after the Battle of Mogadishu, um, and she paid the price psychologically for it. And I think this is going to sound crazy to you, uh, or to some people, but I believe our Lord was merciful to her and took her because he knew what was coming. And he knew she wouldn't be able to handle it anymore. I've talked to some people who would agree with you. Um, I understand that, and, and you're 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 probably right. You're probably correct. <clears throat> you know, I and you know the other blessing when I think about it is that you know in my lifetime I'm going to be 59 this year. I've had two two amazing women as wives. Both of them died for cancer. I've taken care of both of them uh, as best as I could at the end. Um, but, you know, and that's another testament to the Lord. How many men get two wives that totally love them in their lifetime? <sighs> you know, people underestimate the power of prayer and the love of God. They really do. Man. Uh, you, can't imagine and, what, you know, what, what you've been going through. But and, yeah, for you to, to have your faith and, and for you to still be strong in that faith um, is such an inspiration for me. And I know it has to be for other listeners out there. Because what you've gone through is, is something that is... Um, a nightmare scenario for most of us. Not once, but twice. Mm -hmm. Yes. I lost my wife, uh, my first wife, Cheryl, um, right at the beginning of the invasion of Iraq. Um, uh, I was getting CCAT teams ready to deploy to the Middle East, and um, she passed away then. Uh, and I met my wife through the Air Force because she was a CCAT nurse in the reserve, and I was the pilot unit leader at the time. So I had a lot of contact, and that's how I met her. But um, I I'm telling you, you, you know, God acts in ways that we can never even possibly imagine. You know, and, and you got to give him the chance because you may be praying for one thing, and he's saying, no, that's not what you need. I'm going to give you what you need. That's yeah. right. Because I have other plans. I have other plans. And yeah. I, <laughs> they don't line up with what we what we plan on most of the time. Um, that's for sure. No, and if you're like me, it's no, the hard no. way you learn. Um, but, you know, just watching people's response from the interactive chat to what's going through my mind is uh, to, to what you've been, what you've gone through is something that uh, while you remain in the Lord, he will build you up, and 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 uh, you will be at a, a stronger point in your faith than ever before each day that goes by. And you're—I uh, don't want to sound cliche, or, or uh, but you're you're over the hill. You're over the the hard stuff. If you you're still of sound mind after going through what you've been through, uh, nothing on this earth can take away your your uh, peace of mind, your your faith. And in your walk, uh, not now, that you and, should sit and, back and, and relax, but but you've um, uh, been been tested. You've been uh, been through the fires of hell yeah. for sure. I I have been, but you know the the thing that uh, puzzles me, and I've been trying to read up more about it. And I I wish one of your religious people that you know one of your pastors or something, and, you know. And it's I always get wonder. Okay. Uh, I know I'm going to have somebody tell me in the back of my brain what it is I'm to do next. Um, but it's, you know, how you, you know, because I pretty much muddled through all this. I mean, I mean, with God's help, I've muddled through it. But, you know, how do you know what God's will is and what he wants you to do uh, and <clears throat> the appropriate filter for figuring that out? I you know, have I've the heard same question. Just a little bit. Of, what's that? I, I you know I, I asked that same question to Pastor Langford this uh, this past week. I I, I, I asked, 
I asked Pastor Langford, I said, how do you know? How do you know? And that's a great question. How do you know it's God's will? How do you know what is God's will for you, you know? What's the filter? I I don't have that answer. I've been looking in the Bible for that, to be quite honest. And, you know, and I don't pretend to be any expert at all. I'm still learning. You know, well, one thing I know is, uh, is, is to pray uh, that you know each day that we do the, the Lord's will and not our own. Um, and that's one basic, you know, biblical way uh, that I know of. My goodness, though. If I can ask, and I'm, I don't mean to put you on the spot, she died last week, your wife? Yeah, she she passed away on Wednesday at uh, Penn State Medical Center. Okay. Um, yeah. Because um, we just talked a few weeks yeah. back. Yeah. It, 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 I, I'm telling you, man, <laughs> after listening to Chris Putman and a few others on supernatural issues and reading... Nancy Nistler's article on spiritual warfare. Um, you know, it's like Nancy put it a real good way. Satan doesn't give a rat's behind about the the Sunday go to meeting people who live in the flesh the rest of the week because he already has them. But for for those listeners out there uh, who are having a hard time. Nancy talks about how the more you walk with God, it's like putting a big target on yourself. It's like a big kick me sign. Yep. And we were we were trying to walk as hard as we could with the Lord. We, you know, we went to that Bible prophecy conference that we heard about, and after that is when everything started going wrong with her. Uh, and the harder we prayed. You know, the more we read the Bible, the more we, it just seemed like it just kept coming harder and harder. And it took over. It, it, you know, we we're sitting down with her doctor over at Penn State, who they have a really good integrative complementary alternative position over there. And we were working on every model, metabolic pathway that you can think of. We were throwing the kitchen sink at this, and this thing just went right around it. So it was it was going to happen. Um, and I don't say that cavalierly. Um, that there's, I think there was a spiritual component to it. I don't know whether it was the Lord taking her, which I think he finally did, but somebody was it, it coming after her hard. And it, it was trying her. You know, because she, in, in the end, she was more worried about me than she was of herself. She she questioned God as to why this was happening to me again. And I told her, you know, <laughs> I sat down kneeling at her chair telling her, this is, this is God's will. This is what God has decided I need to do. It doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter in the end. God picked me to do this, and I'm going to do what he, to, what he wants me to do. You know, I, I, made, I made a vow to God in church that I would, you know, take this woman and, you know, love her to the end and take care of her to the end. And, you know, when you do that with the Lord and you stay by him, he's going to take care of you. And it's not a matter of it's fair or anything. Of course, you know, who cares whether it's fair? It's what's right and what God asked you to do is really what it basically comes down to. In my conversation with Pastor Langford, he did say that, you know, the the more obedient you are and the and the greater works that you do the, the the further down the path you go is you know satan is not going to uh mess with the people who are already uh you know who are partying and and you know having a Mar- mardi gras every day you know satan's going to go after the people who pose a a real threat and and do who are walking the the, the walk of right God, you're not you know? seeking to devour those who he's already right. devoured so exactly. So, what you said certainly makes a lot of sense. Now, it, it, it's probably with God's mercy that 
you know, he's he's embraced your wife. Uh, you know, now you still have a job to do. Do you? Would it be? I don't want to invade your privacy, but do you feel like sharing with the listeners your first name so people can pray for you? Uh, my first name is Greg. Okay. Okay. I mean, I didn't want to. Re- I didn't want to remind people because I, I remember. But, <laughs> you know, I remember no, meeting I, I, honestly, you. Honestly, I. I came on because I thought I I, tr- I wanted to talk to you all the night or when you had your first open line because I thought it was really important to the listeners that may be struggling that God God is loving and merciful and things don't always work out the way you ask for Him but in the end you can feel His love if you stand with Him and you walk with Him. And I don't mind sharing my name. I don't mind sharing uh, sharing that at all because it's an important part of, of getting the word out about our Lord. If there's anybody out there with any questions in their mind or who are struggling, do not. You, you uh, Go to Nancy Missler's website and, and look at her series of blogs on hard times from her book, Dark Night, and, and read them uh, and, you know, Read about the words of Job and Elijah and, and Paul and Stephen and what they went through and how their total surrender, even though it may end, not ended up the way they wanted uh, or the way they would have liked, they remained faithful. And in the end, they're with the Lord. And who that's all that really matters, isn't it? Absolutely. And amen. Uh, you said that uh, very accurately. Look at Job. Look at Daniel. Look at... Peter, uh, these men did not, you know, get a uh, magic carpet ride from birth to heaven. They had to go through the most uh, difficult trials of of different kinds, from loss of families to loss of their own life, uh, you know, if not to obey the government, and uh, for for a number of reasons, all for, for their test of faith. And they are the examples of faith that we need to look up to in the scriptures. And Greg, I want to thank you for for calling in and sharing tonight with us your story. At the end of the program, you're uh, an inspiration, and uh, your faith is something to be looked up to. And uh, I hope people are um, moved by by your call tonight, and that they you know continue on their path. I, I certainly uh, am. Yeah. Go ahead, Greg. It's it's. Yep. Good night, and everybody take care. God bless you both. Greg, thank you so much for sharing, and, and uh, God bless you, my friend. We'll be in touch. Yep. Take care. Have a good night. You too. That'll, That'll do it for us tonight, folks. Yes. Tomorrow we will be here, just you and me. Thursday, Paul McGuire will be joining us, and Friday, Pastor Langford and Steve Quayle will be joining us. Following week, we will have Tom Horn on, and we'll get into the next week's schedule as we move on closer to the weekend. Stay safe out there, everybody. Have a good night. Until tomorrow, God bless.